Yes. Okay. Okay, I call this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. Begin by saying, in accordance with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, signed by Governor Baker on June 16, 2021, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A, this meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted with some remote participation. In-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, and a quorum of the school committee will be in person. This meeting is concurrently being presented through a Google Meet and by NORCAM to allow the public and any school, com school committee members who cannot attend to participate. I will point out that myself, Scott Buckley, Rich McGowan, Janine and Briano are in person. Chris Papavasilio is on, on the Google Meet, and Diana Boutwell is not with us today. We also have our superintendent and both assistant superintendents here. So welcome everybody. Um, we will begin with public input. And just to remind anybody that might have comments or thoughts that you're limited to three minutes. And I would just point out with the audience, we have a lot of young people here. So Mr. Ewell, and, and, and please say your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Jeffrey Ewell, 127 Park Street, <coughs> First of all, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Nope. That's for Norcam. Can you hear me? No. Nope. It's, it's just for Norcam. That's for Norcam only. That's for Norcam. Okay, so I don't have a microphone. I'll talk as loud as I can, okay? Uh, first of all, I just want to announce that the North Reading Republican Town Committee is going to have a candidates' night at Kitty's on, Ap on April 27th, Wednesday. All candidates uh, have been uh, informed, and they will be. Uh, it will be confirmed, and we will have uh, in the back room of Kitties. Uh, <coughs> doors will open at 6:30. I think it's a great opportunity for everybody to uh, meet the candidates uh, and ask them questions and and, and so forth. Uh, I do have a comment I, I'd like to make uh, as well. I understand, as you mentioned, uh, that the public uh, uh, comment uh, is has a time constraint to it, which means that those who are wishing to speak will have their comment abridged, unfortunately. By definition, that's shortened. I have in my hand a copy of the United States Constitution. Please permit me to read part of the First Amendment relating to free speech. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or the right of peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The school committee is the Congress of the school district. There is room, this room is where citizens peaceably assemble, and here where we petition the school committee for redress or grievances. As elected officials, you are responsible for knowing the confines of your authority under the U.S. Constitution. With this in mind, I ask that you, by motion of the committee, permanently rescind the three-minute abridgment of speech imposed by this board. By doing so, you will open the doors of much-needed transparent dialogue between parents and school committee. And with that, I hope I was under those three minutes for you, but I'm not going to give you each a copy of the Constitution of the United States. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> The, the, the only response that I would say, Mr. Yule, is public comment is usually for things that are not on the agenda. And so if there are things that you would like to put on the agenda, you can make a request. And if we think it's something that is under, you know, under our authority, we could add that to the agenda in the future. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Jeff Simons, I would just like to take a couple minutes to thank Janine and Briano. <laughs> Sorry, it was just getting the uh, microphone for you. But you can keep talking. <laughs> she wants to hear that twice. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> no. Hi, Jeff Simons, uh, 31 Hickory Lane. Uh, as Janine Embriano wraps up her tenure as school committee, I would like to come in in person, thank her so much for all her years of dedicated service to the students, staff, um, the creation of this beautiful building, love driving up here just it's a hive of activity all the time and Janine had such a big role to play in so many things and in the days when there weren't too many candidates running for school committee she just kept running and running and running and thank you thank you thank you so much Janine and good luck to you thank you
Thank you, Mr. Simons. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Yes, ma'am. Doris Romulus, Six Point Street. I see posters in this town with words, hate has no home here. Under those five. Yeah, it's just for NORCAM. Just, just, under, speak up. Yeah, just to clarify, the microphones are just for NORCAM, so if you want to be heard in the whole room, you just need to speak up. All right. I see poster in this town with words, hate has no home here. And under those five words, the diverse population in the town and the state are not being represented. For example, a patriotic black immigrant, a church-going Christians, a middle-class white man, not represented. The anti-racism you adopted made me realize what is missing in the heart of man, human being, mankind. The word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8a, what love is. He says, love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does, love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing nor wrong thinking. But love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. And that kind of love never fails. In the word of Dr. Martin Luther King, he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. I grew up in a third world country where I have experienced what is a blackout. And whenever that occurred, once a candle would bring up um, and light up, it, will, it would eliminate the entire room. So I know for a fact what he meant when he said only light can drive out darkness. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. If I would run to the enemy, to the devil, and presented him, and present him with the anti-racism resolution as my protective shield, he will eat me up and have a barrel of wine after that, because that does almost nothing. The anti-racism resolution says nothing that made me feel secure in this community. In fact, it frightens me. Therefore, I urge to reconsider that resolution today. Thank you. Sir? Drew the Patty, 6 Flint Street. Critical identity theory. You may have heard critical race theory or queer theory and other sorts of critical theories out there, but I kind of mash them together, have critical identity theory. So what is the definition of that? The organizing principles of society are racism and homophobia. White heterosexual people have constructed society and all its institutions to perpetuate their own power and oppress all others. So how is that connected to the diversity, equity, and inclusion program here that was made policy on July 20th, 2020, when you passed the anti-racism resolution? Let's take the two and a half minutes to figure out what the definitions of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion are. Diversity, hire people of different backgrounds, cultures, perspectives to create a rich environment of exchange, learning, and growing. This is something I fortunately had the uh, experience of in my schooling and work and now with my family and this is something I think all of North Reading could could get behind but what does a critical identity practitioner actually think the definition of diversity is hire people who are trained in diversity who have an authentic understanding of the privileged and oppressed and they're able to enforce the rules of DEI so interestingly this criteria would filter out my wife who actually checks a lot of check boxes in terms of diversity, immigrant, black, women, um, second language, all kinds of other things, because she doesn't take on the world view of the privileged and oppressed. In fact, if she snuck through the hiring process and she became an employee, she would actively resist this, and she would actively recruit other people to resist it as well. Moving on to equity. What is equity? Equality of opportunity and equality before the law. These are as American as apple pie. And I think all of North Reading can get behind this. So let's take all of the divisive national politics 
out of the school system and adopt a traditional ideal like this. Let's unite behind this. But what are we really uniting behind? What does a critical identity practitioner think equity is? Equality of outcomes. If outcomes are not fair or particular for particular identity groups, then resources need to be redistributed. In addition, reparations are required for all past injustices. Quick example, Harvard University, Asians are too successful there. They took seats away from Asians, gave it to other identity groups. Finally, inclusion. What's the definition of inclusion? Ensuring people are welcomed, not banning certain types of people. All of North Reading, not all, but probably most of North Reading can get behind a definition like that. What does a critical identity practitioner think inclusion is? It's actually an inclusive environment can only include those who have consciousness of their privilege or oppression. And in, in order to attain that inclusion, certain views or people need to be excluded. Quick example right here. I am a white man talking about racism and identity and all these sorts of things. Clearly, I have no consciousness of my privilege. And this, is, this makes us not an inclusive environment. So, you know, you would do things like maybe shame me or figure out how to censor me or eventually maybe throw me out of the, the meeting in order to get that ideal of inclusion in this meeting. So July 20th, 2020, you passed the anti-racism resolution unanimously. DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion was in that resolution twice. I ask you, what did you mean by those words when you put them in there? And what did you instruct Dr. Daly to implement in the school system? I look forward to hearing from all of you tonight on that. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Excuse me. Did, could you tell me which grade your kids are in? I have a 17 month old Bronx Habanero de Patty with my wife Doris. We've been residents of here since 2016. So you haven't seen any materials coming? I've seen a lot of materials. <clears throat> Clearly, all the materials that you've posted on YouTube, I know quite a bit about what you and what you say, and I've reviewed every single PowerPoint that's out there in the public domain. Okay. So, again, I, I just want to say for everyone that's watching, because I've, I've received a lot of emails about this, um, the, um, can I help you? I really wanted to hear from the school committee. I, you're the policy makers. Sir, sir yeah. Dr. Daly is speaking. My question Dr. Is Daly is speaking, sir. Are the policy makers going to respond Dr. to me? Dr. Daly is speaking, sir. Excuse me. So I just, I just want to be clear that we have, uh, the way you have, you've come to several meetings, the way you've defined certain terms, certain programs, certain curriculum, I've said this many times. I think if we were doing any of the things that you described, I would have an issue with them myself. I've said that many times. When we did have a forum uh, last year, and we did define what equity, diversity, and inclusion meant, when we shared that out, whenever we've talked about it, we've absolutely used much closer to your, your earlier cards that you held up than your, than your later cards. So I think that we have to be very careful whenever we take things that are from a national curriculum or from other places in the country and try to apply them here. Isn't that where DEI came from? DEI is a national program. So, you got it nationally. So again, these are, these are concepts that we're learning in our schools. These are, this is part of our frameworks. These are part of our standards. So we'll be having a forum on March, um, sorry, on May 11th that we're going to be sharing a lot more, getting into a lot more detail about exactly what these programs are because there's so much misinformation out there about what is actually happening in our schools. Um, and I, I think, you know, I think it's very much important that we, um, I'm sorry? Yeah. So um, I think it's very important that we, we clarify for people. So we'll be in this room on that evening and we can really go through, you know, what a curriculum is, what, what people have the right to, to learn in a public school and what the, the correct procedures are. You know, and, and I think you brought up some points Last meeting that really concerned a lot of people in the community about about this, you know, when you know what procedures we're following, um, whenever there is a uh, an issue or something that we're just not going to tolerate, we're going to make sure that we provide a safe learning environment for everyone and we communicate out. So I think there's some concern that we want to make sure we address and clarify any misinformation. So we'll be doing that in greater detail that night, working with our DEI coordinator, and um, and sharing with the community. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes, Mr. Barrett. I'll pass it up. I'd like John Barrett to Dogwood Lane. Um,
following up from, from Drew's comment, um, for the May 11th event, I would like, if possible, the uh, school committee to take an action tonight, an action item, to present um, in the early part of this uh, briefing their working definitions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Can you pass it down one more? <clears throat> This thing work? It doesn't even work, right? Well, why, why are they passing it around if it doesn't work? It's for Norcan. the cable. Oh. You're on TV. It's not the first, not my last time. Hello, my name is Sterling Smith. I'm from Arlington, and I've been an educator for 30, 30 early childhood education educator for 30 years in the public school system, Winchester school system, and the Arlington school system. Um, talk louder. <laughs> she can do that. She can I can do that. <laughs> I don't understand what happened to reading, writing, and arithmetic. I see a very undiverse audience right here. You're a bunch of white people. Where's the, where, where's the diversity? Where's the inclusion? Where, where, I've been to too many meetings. To, and how you, have you asked any of your black people or your brown people about their opinions on any of this stuff? That's what I want to know. I don't know what happened to, I think it's all American uh, exceptionalism and American privilege. I don't believe, I do believe that Will Smith is more privileged than everybody else in this room. Nobody's complaining about that. Yet for critical race theory to me is white people trying to make up for something that they didn't do to people that never suffered it. And as a black woman, I am very disappointed in the fact that I've had I have friends in North Reading, I have friends all over the country, all over, the, all over Massachusetts and all over the world. And for some strange reason, five years ago, this wasn't even a thing. So what happened? Who knows? I'd like to know, I'd like to know what happened. But I also, my, I have um, relatives here. Um, my nephew graduated from, um, I forget the middle school. Um, and then he went to a private school because of these things. He is black and he is white. Where, does he get, where is he on that line? Do you separate him because he's white skin, but he has a black mother, or do you separate him because he has a white dad? And it doesn't. Where, where's the where's the where's the line here? And I don't see any of you exhibiting any diversity, other than the fact that there's two women. Oh, it depends on what the, the definition of women is. Uh, so I don't know. Sorry, but anyway. But I I don't understand why what happened to reading, writing, and arithmetic. That there's the, kids don't see color until you show it to them, and create uh, create. CRT to me, CRT reminds me of a person who's raised that says that all men are bad, and every time that kid sees, rose up and sees a bad man, that a bad man. That's what critical race theory is, and this is from the black perspective. Okay, I don't see anything. I was raised to not see color or whatever. We all have isms, we all have prejudices, we all have things that we bring to each other, and and it shows. But this is not going to, this is not doing anything for anybody, and I'd love for you to figure out why you are doing this. Okay? Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Well, I have to. Uh, Michelle Orfanos, Arlington, Massachusetts. Two quick Point things, I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Sorry, the kid. I do what? not believe resident non-residents should be allowed to speak in the meeting. Is that a is that a policy? Is that a rule? All right, then I'll just say it quickly. So um, I do not believe it's funny that the kids are leaving right now. What was your name, sir, with the purple with the pink shirt on? What's his name with the pink shirt? No, no, this is a North Mr. Buckley School Committee meeting. That is correct. That is correct. Oh, but she got to speak because Residents she's of black. North Reading. <laughs> Residents of North White Reading. White Arlington girl this doesn't get to speak. Is it North Reading? So I do, do I get to speak? Oh yeah. Is it is it a public meeting or not? I need to clarify that. Yes, I don't. I, okay. Let it make make your comments. We'll clarify it for the next meeting. Okay. So two quick things. Number one, critical race theory is a hatest Marxist organization that only serves to divide people. We don't need any more division in this world than we already have. It's not helpful. I don't know why any school system would spend time on that. It's not helpful. It doesn't help the kids get along. It puts people in boxes, and we have enough of that. Second thing, you should make it that you can hear people at the public forum. That woman, had a, you had a lovely speech, and I wish I could hear it. And I'll, I'll go back and maybe see the transcript or what have you, but I'm sure it was a lovely speech. And it's unfortunate that at a public, you have to scream. So maybe you could figure that out for the next meeting. Third thing, so when you sat at the meeting, you said, oh, let's be nice in front of the kids. And then you, you chose to scream at that man for something he didn't even do. He said, you know, whatever, Dr. La La is speaking. So he's like, he was talking to her about the camera and you're yelling at him. I think he deserves an apology, right? 
I think he deserves an apology. That was really rude, but you did that in front of the kids right after you chastised us about behaving. Shame on you. So I just hope that everybody can learn from this. We need more open-mindedness, more critical thinking about, you know, why do people feel the way they do? Why are we pushing some hateful agenda that's just going to divide kids? It's unnecessary. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Janine Largent, um, 11 Hillside Road. Um, I'm probably reiterating what a lot of other people said, but you know, it's very difficult. All of these acronyms, right? CRT, SEL, CSE, and all of you implement them with your full authority. But I don't believe any of them are organic. I don't think any one of you said, "Gee, this is a problem we have in North Reading. We need to address." And it's consuming an awful lot of our children's day. And as you can see, it seeks more to be divisive than to unite anybody. Um, I grew up poor. I mean, very poor, really. So, you know, I am white and I'm female and you may not be able to see that. I managed to get through community college and be a nurse for 30 years. I have friends that aren't living on Martin's Pond like me, you know, in a little tiny house. They live in beautiful homes. They've welcomed me. They invited me. If I see that there's any real ist that's an issue right now, it's elitism. It's an elitist problem. And we have a real problem today, and it doesn't really seem to matter whether you are black, white, or otherwise, so long as you hold on to a particular political point of view. And that point of view is, in my opinion, not lifting anyone up but bringing everyone else down to a level where we have two separate classes, a ruling elite and the rest of us. And you are implementing federal programs, Common Core as well. And you, every time it comes around, you think this is wonderful and you sell it to us. But I never saw any one of you ever organically say that we have a problem in our curriculum or in our social environment. And this is what local politics is and are. And I know it's uncomfortable and I know it's difficult, but you're getting a lot of turnout here and there's a reason for it. And I think you should really honestly listen to the citizens of this town. Thank you. Can you st uh, please state your name and address? My name is Diana Ploss. I live in Massachusetts. Your address, please. No, not in North Reading. Not, not a North Reading student, President? So my question is, I know you're getting federal dollars to implement these policies. How much money are you getting? How much money are you getting to implement these policies? Because it's money. We know that it's <coughs> money. That's what it is. So how much money? You can stay for the budget hearing coming up, and perhaps so you'll you don't learn. Want to answer me. So yes or no, are you getting money to implement this? Dr. Daly, do you want to speak to that? No. Again, I think there are no policies that we're implementing. We're implementing the curriculum frameworks. Um, and who's paying you for that? No one's paying us for that. It's the state funding mechanisms for it. Could you say no to it? Could we say no to what? To the money. Could we so not get you, money from yeah, DESE? I think you're, you're yeah, creating so a circular you, argument here. No, There's no, the, the curriculum you, framework is... Excuse, excuse me. Excuse excuse me. Mr. Barrett, you're not speaking. You have not been recognized right now. Because we're trying to move on. This is not on the agenda. This is not on the agenda, ma'am. Okay. At the end of the day, we get funding from DESE. We get Chapter 70 funding. We get general municipal aid okay. that doesn't come tied with a nip with None with putting certain this. programs in or passing resolutions. There's a foundation. There's a there's a budget. There's a formula for how much money we get. We get money from individual taxpayers who live in this in this town. And that's how we fund our schools. There's nothing tied to pass this resolution to get this dollar amount. Okay, so could you say no to this curriculum? And, and just a question. There is no I curriculum. think you should check yourself in your attitude. Yeah. I appreciate your comments. You have to check yourself in your attitude. Okay. Because people are concerned, and they have a right to ask questions. That is perfectly fine. You can ask any questions you like. Check your attitude at the door. Okay. Seriously. Okay. You, is there any, are, are there any others that would like to comment in here? One more, sir. and I've spoken in Winchester as well and I may be a little bit new to the issue but I do see um, literature 
that's in I, evidently in curriculums, but maybe it's not in curriculum, but at least it's in the library. When you come by the library, and it's literature that suggests very sexual stuff, pornography essentially is what it is. Um, you can see it on its face on the covers of the books. I, you know, I could take you out and show show those to you, but I. I'm not going to waste your time doing it. I don't want to waste anybody's time. But it's a real difficult issue. My daughter, who's 21 years old, missed all of that. And she looks back and she says, that's crazy. And I think it's crazy, too. The comment about getting back to what happened to math and arithmetic. I know we have sexual shit that goes on in our, in our families, in our world. That's for the parents. It's not for the school. Many of us pull our kids out of these schools. And we know it's there. And you know it's there as well. Thank you very much. Anybody else want the microphone? I'll take it okay. home. <clears throat> There's no more comments. We're going to move on to the student report. And we have Shivi Srikanth here. Shivi, would you like to jump in and give the student report? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that the students are doing in the high school and some events that have been going on. Um, extracurriculars, for these extracurriculars, the school is hosting its first big trip since COVID started um, to Ecuador. Students will be leaving for the airport on Friday afternoon, which is really exciting. In addition, the entirely student-run social activism club is currently working on a series of events some of which include running student voices in the transcript, working to improve voting and civic literacy among students, and um, working to create student-led professional developments alongside teachers and staff. In addition, EcoTeam just wrapped up one of their biggest events, Tree Plenish, where volunteers and students plant trees in various locations around town to increase biodiversity. In addition, um, there is a event coming up this Wednesday run partially by students from the Social Activism Club, um, which is a Meet the Candidates Night, which allows students and community members to submit questions they may have for school committee candidates. Um, a small group of students, including me, will be moderating this group, and it will hopefully shine a light on some of the platforms of the candidates. Today, um, which was a really exciting event, the school and the parents association put on an assembly for all high schoolers on tools for managing anxiety and depression, which was very vital. Um, moving on to sports, spring sports is in full swing and tennis had a match today while track has a meet. In terms of a couple of um, stats for, for some of the sports, currently in the overall league, boys will play lacrosse is three and one and girls lacrosse is two and one whereas softball is two and two and oh and this is all for varsity sports um in other news juniors recently had junior prom which was a success and in the arts a week-long art show is currently running at the high school maskers just wrapped up their spring play and they were awarded state winners for the terrible infants and they garnered acting and set awards um in addition Notorious is hosting a spring fling this Thursday with other a cappella groups in the area for fundraising. And next Thursday, they go to state finals in New York. Academically, seniors are continuing to commit to colleges, which is really exciting. And AP exams are coming up after April break. Um, for the student work that I wanted to talk about, it's a little bit non-traditional, but I thought it was interesting. In my AP physics class, our teacher has employed a kind of flipped classroom college style of teaching for the last term. Um, and because we are all seniors in that class, the fourth quarter is a really good time to experience and experiment with some college learning. We're basically given a long term list of assignments, projects and tests that need to be completed by a certain point and students must self motivate themselves to study and learn. And our teacher scaffolds and supports us very effectively and he still provides us with class lectures and hands on labs. But this experience we're getting with a new learning environment has actually increased the participation and study level in a usually and notoriously difficult class. So that was just a little bit of a rundown on um, some of this, the events that have been going on at the high school. So thank you. Thank you very much, Shivy. Any you, comments, Shibby. questions? Rich, anything? 
Is anybody going to go go down to New York? Is there going to be a bus or anything going to no for the Notorious event, or is it just permits them? I'm not sure. I think it's just bringing them, but I I don't have that much information on the logistics around the trip. I do know that they're planning on going next Thursday because they've been pretty successful with their fundraising. Great. I may. Dr. Daly, yeah. yeah. I just want to take a moment and, and apologize to, to Shibi and to others who were listening tonight. Shibi, you worked so hard um, founding our, our social activism club and helping us with our anti-racism resolution. And I feel that you know, as, as the leader, I need to do more to try to quell some of the misinformation that's certainly out there in our community that we heard tonight. And I know that I'm going to hear from a lot of parents of color that have reached out to me in the past that are concerned about things they're hearing in the, in the community. Um, and I think it's important to, you know, we had a few folks from North Reading tonight and we had a few folks that are from North Reading to come in and share their concerns. I really think we can all learn together and we can learn and understand what we actually are doing um, to, to do the right thing for our students and for our community. And we're gonna do that in North Reading. And we're going to challenge the misinformation and the confusion that's out there. And I think when we come together, as we did last year, when we had a call, and I know Mr. Yule was in that call, and we came away from that with a much better understanding of what we really mean when we're talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion. I know that shibi has been working with parents and with other students on this challenging work that lies ahead. And so I just wanted to extend to her uh, my gratitude and, and apologies for not doing enough to stand up and to call that information, but we will continue to do that hard work. Thank you for your, your kind words and all of your efforts, Dr. Daly, where I know all the students of color in the high school and minority students in general in North Reading are really appreciative of the work the school and the school committee are putting forth. So thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna move, move on to new business. We have the little school here for their presentation. So Mrs. Molly, if you would like to take over. <clears throat> yeah, and Chivy, as always, stay on as long as you like. <laughs> Chivy, congratulations. Hi, I don't Chivy? know if she heard, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Hi, Chivy. Oh, wow. Well. Did she see me? Chevy. Oops, sorry. Oh, Number sorry. No, out. that's okay. Um, there's someone here that wants to say hi. Hi, Chevy. Hi. <laughs> I'm Smolly. <laughs> Congratulations, I hear, is in order for you. Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> yep, nope, I did that right. <laughs> I'm trying to whisper congratulations, Chevy. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you last know is for what? All the scholarships, yes, or admittances. I know. For or... everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mrs. Molly, welcome. Well, I thought I was going to need to introduce myself to all those perfect strangers, but I think, um, I, I think it's a much more friendly, I'd like to say, only in the fact that you all know me. Um, so good evening. I'm Christine Molly. I'm the principal at the Little School. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to tell you all that it truly is a pleasure to be back here in person, standing here in front of you, and not on the screen dealing with technology issues and so forth. I know that I don't need to tell you um, that the past two years have been incredibly difficult and a stressful time for all of us. Um, we were so happy to be able to return to school in September full time. Um, I think the kids were also thrilled. Many of them told us how happy they were to be back. Our school, like most schools across the nation and probably the world, have seen an increase in social emotional needs as well as educational needs. Uh, school psychologists have never been busier and the addition of a shared adjustment counselor has been extremely beneficial in helping to provide students the support they need during this difficult time. We thank the school committee for recognizing the importance of that school adjustment counselor position. It is greatly appreciated. Tonight's presentation will be closely connected to two of our school improvement goals. One is a social, a social emotional goal for students, that students report that school is emotionally and physically safe and is, a conduce, and is conducive to learning. 
The second one is a cultural competency goal for the faculty and staff, which ultimately affects the classroom. In order to feel emotionally safe, a student must have a sense of belonging and acceptance. The presentation this evening includes projects from Mr. Lynch's third grade and Mrs. Polkari's fifth grade. Both of these projects began as discussions during an open circle lesson, which is a social emotional um, curriculum that we use in the elementary schools. The classroom discussions and the students' curiosity guided their learning. Our students have researched through interviews with their families, et cetera, that they, they researched their heritage, their customs, their family values, et cetera, and how diverse cultures help shape the America that we know today. Through lessons in open circle, social studies, digital learning, music, and art, students have gained a better understanding of what it means to be a global citizen. Additionally, over the past year, faculty and administration have professionally developed and collaborated on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a school, we never lose sight of the opportunities to foster kindness, positivity, and joy, and to create a school culture of support, understanding, and acceptance. This includes fostering a sense of caring, concern, and empathy for others. We are very proud of the work we do at the little school. And we are very proud, thank you, and we are very proud of, of the generosity of the little school staff, students, and families. And you will soon hear our third grade graders tell you about their recent fundraiser to benefit Ukraine. This was all their idea. You may have seen them in the newspaper. I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. On a side note, two of the students who were scheduled to be with us tonight have fallen ill and they were unable to attend, so we're short, two, two less students. At this time, I'd like to introduce just a few people that um, are very important to this presentation. Mr. Lynch is our third grade teacher at the Little School. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly is our digital learning teacher. Mrs. Polkari is our fifth grade teacher. And our students that, I don't know if I'm, there's a particular order, but I'm just going to just wave when I say your name. Alyssa Casasa. <laughs> Daniel DeAnnesentis. <laughs> Casey Fishman. <laughs> Santiago Silva. Audrey DeAngelis, yeah. and Caleb Stasiowski. Yeah. Missing tonight is Megan Mills and Gavin Spencer. So we hope you enjoy the presentation. We will begin with the fifth grade. so that they can see you? They will? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Get this out. Hold it in your hand. Hello, my name is Alyssa Casasa, and I'm excited to share what my classmates and I have recently worked on in Ms. Polkari's fifth grade classroom at the Little School. During Open Circle, we have the opportunity to discuss different topics and subjects that affect our classroom. One recent topic we explored was our family culture and heritage. First, we discuss the meaning of culture and we are able to see <laughs> First, we discovered the meaning of culture and we're able to see different examples of some culture traits like traditions, religions, and food. Ms. Pokari shared the, her culture with the class and asked us to start making some connections. Okay. 
Then we were given directions to create the posters we were about to share. Uh, the, the posters display five traits of our own family culture that we wanted to share with our classmates. Lastly, after sharing our posters with each other, we went around and recorded things we had in common with each other and culture traits that were new to us. We shared our connections and discoveries about each other at the following open circle. It was really interesting to learn about each other and make new connections through this project. Now it's a I would like to share two traits that are important to me and my cultures. These traits are languages and food. My mother's family is from the Philippine Islands and my father's family is of Jewish descent. I'm learning to speak two entirely different languages, Tagalog and Hebrew. Tagalog is one of the main languages spoken on the islands. I speak it to communicate with my mom and her family. Hebrew is an ancient language used by Jewish people all over the world. In my house, it is used during high holy days in prayer. The other trait I would like to share is food. In my house, cooking is a large part of our daily lives. My mom cooks very frequently and we like to enjoy traditional Filipino meals, such as bistec, pancet, and ube. Bistec is a beef marinated in soy sauce. Pancet is a rice noodle dish, usually with vegetables. Ube, purple yam, is commonly used in many Filipino dishes, especially in ice cream. On my dad's side, some of the traditional foods are matza, matzo ball soup, and gel rings. Matza is unleavened bread, very similar to crackers. My favorite are the gel rings, chocolate-covered raspberry jellies. We eat them as a special treat. With Passover coming up on Friday, I'll get to enjoy some of these foods. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed learning about my culture. Hello everybody, I'm Daniel DNSNS, and so I he- I'm kind of represent the DNSNS bloodline. Uh, the um, some of the cultures that I some of the cultures that I represent are um, my food are the food cultures that I love to enjoy eating, and some of the food cultures include my Italian culture, which I will now be uh, talking about. <laughs> One of my favorite Italian dishes is pasta, which roughly originated around 14 years ago. And when, hold on a second, Let's read the fact real quick. Around 4,000 years ago, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and so then what ended up happening? Who must have said 14,000? So uh, and then after the so then the Chinese invented noodles. And so around the 13th century, uh, uh, the Italian took the noodles and turned it into pasta. Some of the, f- uh, the uh, my bella nona makes the pasta. And I love, me and my dad and my mom, I, I mean, this is all speculation. I think my dad and my mom love her pasta. But I can certainly say that it is delicious. And I assume that my bella nona enjoys making it. Another one of my cultures is um, my languages. I don't a couple. I don't really speak very many languages. I only speak Italian and a little bit of Latin. I'm trying to, or I only speak uh, English and a little bit of Latin. I'm trying to learn Italian, but it's supposed to be extremely hard to learn, and I uh, haven't really started it yet. Thank you for uh, taking the time to. Thank you for taking the time for me to um, talk about myself, and I hope you enjoy the rest of these. Hello, my name is Casey Fishman. I am excited to share a little bit about my culture with you. My mom's side of the family is Polish and my dad's side is Jewish, so I am a mix of both. First, I'm going to share a little bit about Polish food. We celebrate a holiday on Christmas Eve called Vigilia. We eat together with family 
We get together with family and eat Polish food. Some of my favorite dishes are pierogi, guamki, and kibasa. I usually help my jaju, my jaju, which means grandpa in Polish, make these dishes. They are delicious. Next, I would like to tell you a little bit about Hanukkah. My, it is my favorite holiday. For eight nights, we light candles on the menorah and sing songs. We also get one or two presents each night and sometimes play with dreidels. Me and my family love celebrating this holiday together. It is really fun. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, are you what? Go ahead. You want me to hold it? Actually, I need to be nervous. You're nervous? All right. Okay. Here's, here's, listen, I'm going to tell you a secret. You know, look out there, right? You can get everybody in your own door. Okay, look out there. So, my... Th- my on my mother's side, my my mother is from Venezuela, from the city of Maracaibo, which is which which is pretty big and pretty beautiful. And my dad, I actually he's he, and he's from Brazil. And I'm going to be talking about languages that I use in food. We use Spanish to talk to my grandmother that only speaks Spanish and we use it to speak to each other. And for food, we we eat empanadas, which are like, they're like pierogies and, but they're filled with meat or cheese and they're pretty delicious. I got I met. <laughs> and my name is Santiago Silva. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Pertavi. This was a really wonderful. These were beautiful to see in the hallway. Very, very nicely done. As a person who grew up in a family that was very tied to their culture. You know, we, I knew exactly where my grandparents were from in Sicily and Italy and everything. I, I think it's wonderful that the children are learning about their culture. Um, and I agree, Italian is not easy to learn. I do remember one line from eighth grade Italian, and that was, Dove la biblioteca? I'm going to Italy in July, and if I ever need to know where the library is, I'm all set. Because that says, where is the library? It's the only thing I remember. So. Thank you, fifth grade. And now we're going to turn it over to the third grade, Mr. Lynch, um, Mrs. Kelly, and um, Caleb, and Audrey. You can stay right over here. When we did the Family Heritage Project in Digital Learning, <coughs> we learned where our ancestors are from. We used culture grams to research more information about the countries. <coughs> we did a survey before starting the project, and now we have learned so much. We were surprised that most of our classmates' families came from the same continent. We made a stop motion video to share with you.
Is there no one else in here that is outraged by this? Is there no one here that is outraged by this using children as propaganda? Propaganda. <laughs> we were happy that we were able to help Ukraine. We were <laughs> We were happy that we were able to help Ukraine by raising eight hundred and two dollars. We had <laughs> We had a hat day fundraiser to raise the money. Part of the fundraiser was to make posters and hang them in the hallways around the school. That is how we helped support Ukraine. We used a database called Culturegrams to research one of our countries of heritage. We made posters in Google Slides and then made a Kahoot to stump our classmates. We would like you we would like to invite you to play. Please use your phone to go to Kahoot.it. If you'd like to play, you can go to Kahoot.it. So where do I put this? The microphone here. Right, I'll just keep, yeah, just keep it for comments. Remember, like. Wait, I'll do the first time. I'll do the first time. Remember the race? Yes. The yes. First yes. Yes. The yes. 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 Wait, should I say? Should we say the game pin? Say what, huh? Should we say the game pin? Yeah, go ahead and read it out loud. So, I'll say it. The game pin is 106 0581. No space. No spaces. Yeah, don't forget that. Wait, you want the phone? No. Space. No. Nope. Yes. No space. Oh, wow, we have a lot of people. Can I help you out here? Oh, God, there's a lot of people. <laughs> I didn't think there was even a lot of people. Oh, wow. Is any of these people that are in a car? Uh, I'm a cough. Is, is Royal Lemur here? No. Yes. yes. All right, let's start. Ready, no, guys? Oh. You can only enter your own name on, like, on Chromebook or computer. Okay. Ready? Go. Okay. What is the most popular sport in Canada? S red soccer, blue football, yellow hockey, or green tennis? One person voted soccer. Everybody voted hockey. <laughs> what is the most popular language in Scotland? Red, Spanish, blue, Polish, Polish, Polish. Okay. yellow, French, or green, English. The, the correct w answer was English. <laughs> the first pizza was made in Red Rome, Boston. Yellow Boston, Naples. Blue Naples, and Green Greece. It's Rome. Naples, Italy. The answer was Naples. I never knew that. Oh, wow. A lot of people voted red. 
<laughs> what colors make up the flag of Greece? Red, blue, and white. Yellow, blue, and yellow. Red, I mean, uh, blue, red, white, and blue. And green, red, and white. Red, white, and green. The correct answer was red. On Thai, Thai New Year, they eat a lot of food, red, blue, clean the house, green, set off fireworks, yellow, throw buckets of water at each other. No, it's not all of the above. No, all of the above answers. The answer oh was throw buckets of water at each other. Why? A lot of our classmates also said the fireworks. Why? Oh, good for you. Um, they they were mo not done for this presentation tonight. They were just done because the learning was guided by the students' interests. Um, and I just thought it was fabulous, and I wanted to share it with you oh, here tonight. You um, we appreciate all the teachers and their hard work and what they do on a daily basis. And of course, thank you for being here tonight on, on your own time. Before we leave, I'd like to take one moment to just thank Mrs. Imbriano and Ms. Mr. Papa Vasilio, who I can, isn't I here. I can never say it either, don't worry. <laughs> um, for the countless hours devoted to the North Reading Public Schools, may the sunflowers in this bouquet remind you of our admiration for your volunteerism, <laughs> to honor your loyalty, devotion, and longevity. We thank you for your service and wish you peaceful days ahead. Thank you. Chris has raised his hand. Yeah. Chris, M Mr. Papa Vasilio, go ahead. I need his address. <laughs> Hi, is this uh, is this working? This okay, is. Good. Sorry, I've got tech problems and now my camera just died. But I'm Ms. Molly and uh, and all of the kids in that incredible presentation, um, some of whom speak a little Latin, which makes me happy inside in my deepest of hearts. Um, Thank you so much. It has been a true pleasure working for the town. And, and honestly, these days when we get to have the presentation to the kids are just the best days of the year. It's great to see uh, all the work they put in and, and get to see them come out and share it with the community. So thank you for everything you've done. Other you. comments from the committee? Mr. McGowan? I would just say thank you guys. That was great. It's a shame that um, certain members of the community who are here tonight did not stay to learn a bit, little bit of, about um, what we are actually doing in the schools as opposed to what they think we're doing. So, but thank you. Thank you. Is Brianna anything? I still have my friendship rock. I think yes. I still have my autism. <coughs> I have my poppy. I love going to your guys' presentations. You guys do such a good job. So you should be proud of yourselves. Yep. Thank you. I just want to let you know that I passed out earlier on the inside back cover. There are two QR codes. One is a video that I put together for kind of just to memorialize the last two years from the time of March 20, March of 2020 when we closed our doors to the present day when we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so that is the bottom QR code. It has some really awesome music um, associated with it. 
And the other one is um, a social emotional um, activity that we did. We offered it out to families. It was the Jumping for Joy photo shoot. So I've compiled a lot of the photos into a short video. I haven't even sent it out to the families yet, but I will be doing that tomorrow. Um, so if you have some time and you just want to smile a little and, and, you know, and recognize everything that we've gone through and the important work that we all do, including yourselves, then please take a moment to look at those videos because I think they really hit home why we do what we do. So thank you. Thank well, you. I, 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 get to, I get to say my thoughts too very quick. Oh. I just, I love the little school. Obviously, I'm a homer, and so I appreciate you guys coming. <laughs> The, the one thing that I think is really nice from these presentations is also just the interaction of like old school posters, which I remember, with you know using Kahoot and the integration. You know, for before COVID, we were so much you know hands on and not as much digital. And like every once in a while, you know, a, a computer pushed its way into the classroom. Then we were all too far digital. You know, like I think everybody remembers the days that everything was digital. I really like how you know we're we're able to now combine that you know, and a lot of that is from you know from the top down, from the administration, from the principals, from the teachers that are really using those techniques. And you know, no one's ever going to look back and say we were thankful for COVID, but we do have to find the joys in in anything that happens. And so, like, I really do love seeing you know how how the how the technology is being used. And you know, I just I'm so impressed. Like every time somebody comes to the school committee. I'm, I'm just like, I, I would have been like the worst student compared to you guys. Like you guys are so much far, so far advanced to where I was. And it's just amazing. It's amazing what you guys are doing at fifth grade and you know, in third grade even. And I'm just very impressed by all of you. So thank you guys very much. Keep doing it to the teachers. You know, we're all dealing with you know, a lot of outside noise, but you know, keep doing what you do, and yep. you know we have a great school system. We have great teachers, and you know, as long as I'm here, I, I intend to make sure that kind of stays that way. So you're here. Um, so congratulations and thank you guys. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. You're welcome to stay, but you can also bring your students home. So. No, I want to stay. You can stay. You can sit right up here if you'd like. You want to stay? <laughs> He's thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alright. We'll just wait a couple minutes just to clear out and then just, uh, begin again. Just shows we just need to improve our game a little bit. On the next I know. Um, I think in this case it would have been uh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hmm? Like, I would, um, from that, um, gem store that I bought them from, that I totally bought them from. Should I go to the Korean uh, survey first? What's that? I was going to say that back when I was going to say that. I just go in order? I just go in order. I mean, <coughs> For those on the meet, we'll be right back in just a minute or two here. Just a minute or two. Mrs. Cloney? I just wanted to say a quick thank you for the fast action on the chat situation. So, thank you. Yeah, thank Mr. Colleen. Yep. Chat. Give us one minute, guys. Oh, uh, now the boring stuff. I know. Mike, you're up. Don't <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. All> that. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I'm not going to be insulted by the romantic, by the way. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. Do we want to? Do we want to go to budget? Do we want to jump ahead to the couple of other presentations first? What do you think? Um. And do budget? We'll, think we'll do budget. Yeah, we're on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, for I, the budget, we do need to have a motion to open the budget hearing. I will move that we open the budget hearing. 
Janine second. Janine second, please. I second. Okay. So since we have some people remote, we'll have to do a roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. And my, I'm an I as well, so 4-0. And I turn this over to Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Connolly. Handing out things. Great, so I have a, um, I'm gonna start by presenting. I'm, I'm gonna try to be brief, I say that a lot. <laughs> um, but I have about 15 or 20 slides or so to get through. That we already did kind of a detailed presentation, much of which is similar. If you were here at the March 7th um, presentation, so I'm gonna to try to move a little bit faster through some of the information. Uh, but these are the topics I'm gonna to touch upon. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the revenue sources that go into a school budget. Focus on the budget drivers, get into what the school department through the school committee and administration's budget priorities were, break down a little bit of the numbers, you can see where the money's being spent. Talk about staffing, um, there are always some new staffing positions driven by enrollment, driven by our strategic plan that are reflected in the recommended budget. Um, I'm going to touch upon offsets and cover um, the topic of Chapter 78, um, which is a complicated topic, but I have a few slides that I've added in that touch upon the state um, Chapter 70 formula. Um, we are still dealing with the budget gap, so the school committees um, between the March 7th presentation and tonight's meeting has had a couple of workshops, or one workshop, and we have workshopped um, areas where what would be necessary to close that budget gap and, and to come down within balance um, at this point in the process. And then we'll just conclude with where we stand. Um, so revenue sources, certainly um, no surprise in a municipal school department budget that the local property taxes are gonna be over 74 or over 70% of the revenue piece of the pie. Um, then there's state aid, that's the, that's the chapter 70 um, educational state formula as well as unrestricted local aid which all goes into funding um, a school in both municipal budget. Um, local receipts, which is also part of the revenue plan, help, help fund both school and municipal town budgets. Local receipts, items like exercise tax, trash fees, mails tax, um, permits, licensing, and so forth, all uh, make up local receipts. Uh, then what's kind of outside of the revenue plan in a sense that the school department receives is our uh, federal and state grants um, that we receive from both the state and federal, uh, both from the state sources and federal sources. And we also have various revolving accounts for tuition-based programs, full day kindergarten, you know, preschool, athletics, extracurricular, transportation, performing arts, all the types of um, bus transportation that we charge and assess a fee for, for optional programs, um, all work to rec actually go in and, and work as a direct offset to the school department budget. So we're gonna to touch upon that at the end as well. Um, so there were four major budget drivers in this year's FY23 budget. Um, these are really been pretty consistent over the last number of years if I've looked back and it's really no surprise that um, Certainly, these four items are certainly driving a, a school budget. Um, contractual salary obligations, th these are, you know, our salary obligations to meet our, um, you know, cost of living increases for professional and support staff. Um, salaries make up over 83% um, of a school department budget. That is a very common uh, stat that you'll see, you know, throughout the, the Commonwealth, really, um, when, you, when funding a school budget. So, because we're made up of, of um, you know, that's the largest piece of the pie, those contractual salary obligations really to fund kind of modest cost of living adjustments for, for personnel. Um, and that's, that's not benefits, I was asked that last time, it's really just the, the salary piece, the benefits are part of kind of the revenue, the revenue plan by the town, um, is, is it going to be a, a pretty uh, big cost driver and budget driver in a school department budget. Um, so that is certainly the case for next year. Then you have our operational costs. So the district has many fixed cost increases that at times have presented a, a challenge. I think the school department's done an exceptional job over the last five to 10 years 
really controlling our operational costs, like utilities, other fixed cost increases, um, all the, the systems that go into running our campuses, running our buildings. Um, they do have inflationary increases that we have to adjust line items for. That's our heating and cooling system, our HVAC, our plumbing system, our wastewater treatment facility, um, you know, bus transportation, everything that kind of goes into to operating a, a school system has some inflationary increases, but we work very hard here in North Reading to uh, put measures in place to control those costs. And I think we've done a really good job with that, but it's certainly a driver. And then this last piece I'm going to get into a little bit later on, but I talked about staffing increases. So we <clears throat> certainly have increases with enrollment. Yes. Are, are you presenting this? Can you present it for the oh, meeting um, or not? I'm not on on this computer. I think right. you mind driving. I know, I know. Rich put my camera on it, so if that's... I can do it. Okay. Yeah. Just to make it easier. I mean, my camera's presenting, so you can pin that one, I guess, but... Okay. Just in case it's easier. I think my okay. camera's on. Yeah, it's, it's coming, so... Thank you. Um, so certainly I'm going to talk about some positions that we've had to uh, add into the budget request driven by enrollment, mostly at the elementary level, and then certainly positions driven by our strategic plan to continue to uh, drive the district forward and our strategic plan is known as NRPS 2025. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, special education costs, um, certainly, uh, um, certainly a, a driver of the school budget. It has been um, historically in the past. These are both kind of in-district and out-of-district special education costs. Um, the district doesn't anticipate that there will be an increase in the number of students that will require um, outplacements and to be educated outside of the district. Um, that is sort of a common trend um, you know, across the state. Our numbers of both students that are being, that receive special education services both in district and out, outside of the district are actually very similar to statewide averages um, when you, when you uh, look across um, the state and those trends. But certainly, um, you know, that's certainly a driver of this budget um, because we do anticipate some of those numbers increasing next year. Um, when we get into the numbers, you can see how we can compare fiscal 23 budget into these major expense categories that we have come to look at um, with the current fiscal year, fiscal year 22. Um, I think you can kind of see the four drivers somewhat at play when you look at the percent increases. Um, salaries going up 4.6%, so I spoke how contractual salary obligations are the largest piece of the pie. And then because we have some uh, enrollment driven increases for staffing at the elementary level, coupled with some additional positions that we are recommending that are driven by our strategic plan, it's no surprise that that being the largest piece of the pie that that number is going up by about 4.6%. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we've done a really good job controlling some of those operational costs, transportation, maintenance items, operational items, like, um, and you know, we've, we've been able to reduce in certain areas, even though there are some increases on, on the utility side, side to, to control, that, control that number. And then the last item here is the, the out of district tuition item, which you can see is, is going up next year. Um, so certainly all netted to about a 5.3% increase over fiscal 22, a little more than 1.8 million. So our local appropriation request um, to, uh, that was recommended is a little over $36 million um, at, at, our, at the preliminary budget. So how are the funds being spent? When you kind of look at the numbers, um, we kind of put these in certain categories. So I mentioned earlier, largest piece of the pie, the salaries and compensation at 83.5%. Um, again, there's no, that's no surprise there. Um, the remaining kind of 16.5% costs, um, I kind of mentioned the last time, the majority of these, those expenses are really fixed, fixed costs. You can see contractual services at 4.2%, utilities at 2.5%. Transportation costs for both special education and in regular transportation at, at 1.4 percent. Uh, our district tuition cost number at 5.2. Those are all costs that are relatively fixed out of our control. That adds up to an additional 13.3 percent. So when you look at some of the discretionary expenses, materials, supplies, professional development costs that um, 
it's really actually a small piece of the pie that's remaining, a little over 3%. So, you know, when we look at where our request being over $36 million, pretty, pretty large number. Um, but the reality of it, of it is what's sort of um, discretionary and is, is really a, a small piece of that pie, about 3%, about a million dollars out of that $36 million dollar number. Um, just looking at the numbers a little bit differently in our functional categories. Um, and certainly there's no surprise there that instructional services is going to be the largest piece of the pie. That's the, the items to fund the classroom materials, textbooks, teachers, s services directly related to the education of students. That should always be the largest piece of the pie and that's certainly been the case um, in North Reading. Um, so that number at, at 77.2%. Um, that's technology as well. Um, administrative cost there is at 3.3%. Um, we are below state average. When we look at that number, I think state average is more about 4%. 9.4% um, is those operational utilities, maintenance costs for a variety of those, those operational services. Um, and the out of district numbers I mentioned earlier is about 5.22%. So just looking at the numbers a little bit differently, you can get a sense of where the funds are being allocated. Um, so I mentioned these positions are the, um, table one is the enrollment driven position. So these would be, these four FTE positions that are being requested would be positions that we would consider um, level, a level services budget request. And that, what I mean by that is that means for us to essentially continue the same level of services with the same class sizes um, that we have current, currently uh, because of the increase in mainly kindergarten and mainly st students and families desiring full day kindergarten next year, uh, as well as some changes as students kind of move on and advance to, to different grade, grade levels at the elementary level across the three schools, for us to continue to maintain the same class sizes that we've come to, to um, really prioritize in North Reading between 18 and 22 at the elementary level we would need these four staffing positions, two of which are professional teaching positions, um, and then two are, are paraprofessional positions that would help support additional classrooms and, cl and, and classes at the full day kindergarten level. So that, that's what we say, that's level services, it's four positions, a little over $207,000, and that's to maintain the class sizes at the elementary level to meet the demand for full day kindergarten and to, to meet the changes in enrollment that happen on an annual basis. And that's, that's um, a level services request. Table two would, was the, the recommended um, administrative uh, to the school committee recommended positions driven by our strategic plan known as NRPS 2025. Um, you see there kind of a COVID-19 focus. So certainly these were always positions that had been in our strategic plan over the last number of years and had been part of that vision um, certainly the pandemic over the last two years, I think, heightened the need for some of these positions. Certainly the social uh, school adjustment counseling um, need and to address um, you know, social emotional needs, the mental health needs across all levels. We were able to fund some of those t these positions in SR, federal grants, which we'll see in a moment. But we, we really want more of these positions so they can be designated school adjustment counselors at every level, at every school, at every building, because um, we feel the need is there. And that would be the highest of priorities out of these four and a half um, FTE positions. Um, certainly a t teaching and learning coordinator had been part of our vision to continue to align curriculum, provide that administrative support for supervision and evaluation, and to work with our curriculum leaders at all levels, but particularly here would probably be the secondary level to help align those curriculum strategies, certainly a need. Um, and then also with a COVID-19 focus, the academic interventionist, that, I have the word upgrade there because we currently have at the elementary level tutors. Um, they're non-professional positions, but they are tutors that work about 15 hours per week at each elementary school and help address areas of learning loss in either literacy, mathematics, reading, they help work with our reading specialists and they've been extremely beneficial and helpful. Um, but we want to take that support to the next level and have de designated academic interventionists coupled with positions that we have in our SR grants, which we'll see in a moment, to provide that additional layer of support in those areas at both the elementary and the middle school. 
So that, that's certainly a, a high priority as well. So these were um, positions that the administration recommended. The school committee certainly, um, can, you know, I think was very much in line with, with this vision in these priority items and areas um, that were recommended as part of the preliminary budget. I don't want to lose sight. The district, and there was a little bit of a question earlier, that we, we have gotten some additional federal funding um, over the last couple of years, and we're trying to be strategic about how we use that funding. We don't want to use it all in one year. We don't want to use it all this year, use it all next year. Um, it's funding that's been a little bit challenging from an accounting standpoint to manage because they all have different purposes and priorities and, and things you have to, to do to, to receive those. Um, they also have different timelines. Um, so we're trying to use the funding of, you know, you know, first as we receive it. Um, but we also are trying to not kind of avoid that sort of that funding cliff scenario. So th this is funding that is available through fiscal 24. We're in fiscal 22 currently. Yes, Ms. Ambriano has a question. Um, can you just state where this is coming from? I mean, it says it on the screen, but just for those who might take, because they're not Yeah, absolutely. Why we are getting extra funding. Yeah, so we are, we have, um, this is, SR is emergency, emer elementary secondary school emergency relief funding. That's what that uh, acronym stands for. It's, it's federal funding that's particularly um, designed for school systems to address areas um, related to the pandemic and the emergency that we've addressed. So certainly, you know, we've chosen in a lot of districts across the state to address that mental health need, that social and emotional need that's resulted or has been heightened as, as a result of the pandemic over the last two years. Um, that's why you see a focus on school adjustment counseling. Um, the focus on digital learning technicians. So certainly, um, when we, uh, one thing the pandemic did result in is us very much accelerating our one-to-one our -one initiative in the district. So pre-pandemic, we were K through six. Post-pandemic environment right now, we are K through 12. So we had to vamp up very, very quickly the number of devices that we have in our district, both from a student perspective, um, as well as even from a staffing perspective. So that required that additional support of an additional 1.5 technician that is allowing uh, those, this robust network that we now are supporting to, to maintain um, the significant increase in devices. And that was very much a, a priority um, with these grants. Yes, Mr. Buckley. Yeah, Mr. Connell, the one thing just to point out, because at the end of this, we're gonna start seeing how we try to balance this budget, but just to really understand the full gravity of the financial situation, these are positions that once, you know, the ESSER funds run out, we're going, going to still want here. I mean, at least some of them. I mean, as we just talked about, technology is in every classroom now. And so we're going to still need digital learning technicians. You know, school adjustment counselors, we're, we're building programs to support our students. We're not gonna wanna just get rid of them. And so for the next couple of years, we'll have the funding, you know, $213,000 right now that we're, we're allocating to this, but in a couple of years, we're going to hit a cliff, and that's going to be more a bigger gap that we have to fill. And so just kind of pointing it out when it's up here, and I think that's, I mean, that's obviously the point here, is four and a half positions are being funded by one-time funds from, you know, an emergency response, but those funds will eventually go away, and I don't know that all the needs will. Like, and again, maybe school nurse or some of that, maybe we don't need all of this, but there's going to be a, a significant amount of money that we're going to lose that we have to decide, are we replacing them? Are we eliminating other positions? And so when we look at how we're balancing the budget this year, it's not the best way to do it because there's a lot of one-time funds that are going to be used that are going, that we just can't anticipate every year. Dr. Daly? I'll just add, to echo that great point, that all of these positions are positions that we've advocated for in the past or in other, in other ways. Certainly the pandemic accelerated some of the need and we're fortunate to have funding to pay for it at this time, but even the, the nurse included, we've advocated for nursing through the budget process, through the visioning process for several years. Um, with a school of our size for the middle school, high school, and, and also the bachelors getting close at times with um, the need for an additional nurse. So having that floater nurse, but certainly obviously during the pandemic, um, we accelerated the technology and certainly the need for mental health exists anyway, but was accelerated by the pandemic, so great point. Great, absolutely. 
Um, great, well said, well said by everyone. Um, so to kind of look at it as a summary, um, again, the, the original uh, recommended budget was an ask of $36,077,169. Again, a little bit over $1.8 million increase. That's the general fund re um, ask. But as I mentioned earlier, outside of that, in part because of the SR funding that we just reviewed, federal grants, and other revolving accounts that I mentioned earlier, state and federal uh, grants, the actual uh, piece of the pie that goes into making the North Reading educational experience is what it is, is a lot greater than that. And, and this is about 3.4 million, a little bit more than that, that's being funded through federal and state grants for a variety of areas, um, as well as those, those programs that unfortunately we do assess a user fee with. I think n no one likes user fees or tuitions. We would love to be able to reduce that. We're, we're working in some areas to do that. It's just obviously a challenge because we don't want to you know, minimize services and the extracurricular you know, programs and the experience for that North Reading student. So th they do exist. And all in all, it adds about three, a little over $3.4 million to the request. So we're really looking at a budget, um, you know, a little bit over $39.5 million. And as you see by the below table, that still doesn't tell the full story because there's still a lot of other gifts and, and donations that the school committee accepts on an ongoing, regular basis to support um, performing arts items, athletic supplies, materials, technology equipment. The PTOs do an exceptional job with their enrichment programs, funding class field trips, funding speakers, funding enrichment activities, funding classroom materials at times for teachers. So a lot of else goes into the piece of the pie that sometimes is not, is not seen and we're, just, we're trying to capture it here. Um, so again, this is just another way of showing it. You have your, your total fund, the general fund, which is the amount that we're asking the, the, the town to support at the annual town meeting in June, the local appropriation piece, taxes, receipts, Chapter 70 state aid that we receive all go in to fund that piece of the pie. And then what's known as special revenue accounts, the federal grants. This is where some of the ESTER money is coming into, the state grants. Um, to help uh, revolve an account and those, those gifts and donations um, all help make up you know, a piece of the, the revenue. So I'm gonna to touch upon chapter 70. Um, I know it's a complicated process, but uh, you know, I'm gonna do my best in a few slides to just kind of give a quick you know, an overview of it. So chapter 70 is the educational funding formula that funds um, school districts in Massachusetts. Um, going back to educational reform in 1993, they revamped the, the process. It's really a three-step process. You know, step one, um, it calculates the foundation budget. And the foundation budget is really uh, meant to represent um, really the, the minimum spending level needed to provide really a fair and adequate education. So that's the foundation budget in the state. Before they do anything else, they, they calculate what that foundation budget is. A variety of factors and variables go into that calculation each year. Um, you know, certainly it's, it's reflected due to changes in student enrollment, changes in student demographic data, grade levels, you know, economic disadvantage status, ELL, Stat, you know, status as well as is an inflationary factor that's kind of applied to that calculation. Um, and the two main factors that I think drive it and make the, the biggest change each year is your enrollment changes and demographic data of your students and that inflationary factor which is set, set by the state. Um, go into calculating step one is the foundation budget, a minimum spending level to provide a fair and adequate education. The next step is they calculate what a community can afford. And this is why Chapter 70 formula is, I think, is confusing because um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Every community is a little bit different. Every community has the ability, um, according to the formula, to afford a little bit more, a little bit different amount um, than, than, than the other or your neighbor in, in existence, for, for instance. So really, this is known as the required district local contribution. Represents the amount of, you know, really local appropriation needed to meet the required net school spending level. Um, property values, median income levels of the community, something known as the municipal revenue growth factor, which is an amount set by the Department of Revenue, 
which attempts to calculate changes in um, the ability for changes in the community's local revenues from year to year. All that kind of factors in and you come up with what a community can afford. So your foundation budget minus what the community can afford, your local contribution in a perfect world really equals your state aid. So you take the difference of the two and you can become up what that becomes your state aid, um, your chapter 70 amount. Um, and state aid is, again, driven by factors. It's, it's kind of composed of different types of aid, foundation aid, minimum aid, but it's essentially the foundation budget, your minimum spending level, um, community can afford, the difference becomes, becomes the chapter 70 you know, state aid uh, formula. Um, so again, you know, this is a chart that just shows you know, districts receive different levels of chapter 70 aid because they, their ability to pay differs. Um, so, you know, not all your know, districts are kind of, the, the formula is doing a little bit of a, you know, a different thing from year to year um, for each district. So you can kind of see, you know, how North Reading compares to some districts in the state. Um, North Reading state aid is equal to about 27 percent uh, um, of our foundation budget um, and the required local contribution is equal to about 73 percent of our, that foundation budget or our required spending level. Um, if the formula was working how the state wanted, and this is where it kind of the other piece that, that gets a little tricky, um, North Reading's target aid is actually a lot less. It's actually 17 and percent, which is the minimum aid level. So when they put education reform in and revamped the Chapter 70 formula, they said every district's going to receive a minimum aid of at least 17 and percent of your foundation. And for whatever reason, back in 1993, things were a little, little out of whack for North Reading. We've, we were always a little bit higher than that. And the state has this kind of hold harmless clause where you're not going to receive less than what you've received the year before. So North Reading, in the eyes of the formula, whether you're right, wrong, or indifferent to that, is getting more Chapter 70 than the formula wants it to do because we're getting about 27% and our target is 17.5%. That's, that's an important factor that I think is probably the most misunderstood factor when folks look at the Chapter 70 formula because they think, you know, the foundation budgets are going up and Student Opportunities Act to fund and increase um, areas where the state should for special education costs and ELL costs and low income costs. So why isn't North Reading getting more or seeing an increase? And it's because in a lot of ways it's because we're already in the eyes of the formula getting more money than the state thinks we should. And I think that goes overlooked a lot. Um, so here's just a factor, but going back to fiscal year 07, they did, the last major changes came in fiscal 07 in the Chapter 70 formula. Um, the Foundation Review Commission attempted to review it back in 2014-15, which led to, uh, eventually led to the Student Opportunities Act, um, which was an effort to really try to fund the foundation budget. Annual increases at a level they should be funded at for costs like health insurance and special education and ELL costs and low income student costs. But North Reading has always kind of had this sort of working against us with the state aid formula, and depending on how you, how you want to look at it. But we've always been above our target. So, and that's been pretty consistent. And that, because of this, in some ways we're almost a little immune to the efforts by the Student Opportunities Act. You know, we're not going to at least initially and into the future, or at least for the next, I would think we could predict safely in the next few years, going to see large increases because we are this far ab above our target, our target aid. Yes. And is it a whole harmless clause that keeps that actual Yeah. I think it, yeah, that has a lot to do with it. So that works in our benefit because if that wasn't there, they could potentially in one year, we're going to readjust it and put everyone down to their target. And then you'll see in a moment that could impact North Reading by about $2 million. So that, so that hold harmless clause is, is, is protecting us in a lot of ways, but it's also not meaning we're going to see large increases. So not to get off track, but that's why you see some, some school districts in the immediate area like Stoneham and Wakefield and Linfield, they're very close to their target or at their target. So when they go through a major change, like we're going to offer free universal full day kindergarten, 
they get the benefit of every one of those students that are now going to be funded at the, the state rate level, and they might see about you know, $3,500 per student by now saying we're not charging a fee. All those students are, are going to be offered universal free full day kindergarten. But because we're above our target in North Reading, if we were to do that, the state would go, oh, wait, you're not gonna, we're not going to give you the $3,500 per student because you're already getting more than you should, so you're going to default to the state minimum, which is like $30 per pupil. So we would get $3,000 more for doing that. And our next door neighbor, Wakefield and Stoneham and Linfield, why were they able to do it so easily? They got $3,500 per student to do that. So this, again, the form is doing something different for everyone. So really quickly, the numbers, um, you can see, again, enrollment has a big factor. You can, you can see our foundation budget. Um, one thing that is happening because the Student Opportunities Act exists is the foundation budget is going up for everyone, including North Reading, because they're now funding annual inflationary costs like health insurance, which was grossly underfunded for years, special education costs um, at, the, at a more appropriate level. So that's a good thing, because as the foundation budget goes up and your local appropriation gets calculated, the, you know, that difference of what becomes Chapter 70 should get greater. Um, so we're, we've been right about a little over $7 million, $7.2 million a year. Um, then you look at our required net school spending, the amount that we're, we need to spend. And North Reading's a little bit unique, as, as you can see. We're, the amount that we're required to spend is about $2 million greater than their foundation budget. So in an ideal world, if the formula was doing exactly what the state wanted it to do, the amount that we're required to expend would equal our foundation budget. But because we're about $2 million greater, and that's because we're getting about $2 million more in Chapter 70 state aid than what the formula wants us to get. So we're required to spend that. If they're going to give us $2 million, we're going to be required to spend it. So that's, that's, if you calculate that out, that's the exact difference. Um, and then you can see the target, 17.5% is our target. And what are we getting? Just under 27%. So that factor at play is, it, it has a lot, lot to do with what's, what's going on in North, in North Reading. Um, and this is just, just historically shows, going back for a number of years, um, these are the different levels of, of, of aid we can receive. Um, so if we were at our target, and the Student Opportunities Act is working in our favor and the foundation is going up, budget's going up, we'd be qualifying for things like foundation aid growth and in different areas here. But we are defaulting to the minimum each year and only receiving the dark blue is the minimum aid. So we're defaulting to what the state sets as a minimum, which historically has been about $30 per pupil. Um, in fiscal 17, it was funded at, I think it was about 55 per pupil, and we're think or $100 per pupil, and we're thinking that might happen. We're anticipating that might go up this year, um, but that's that's kind of what's happening in North Reading. Um, so that's my overview on Chapter Seven. Hopefully, it helps a little bit. Uh, any questions? Yes, Scott. Uh, uh, Mr. Connolly, first first and foremost, thank you. I uh, I appreciate you doing that. I. My goal before I leave the school committee is to try to understand Chapter 70. I may fall short on that goal, but I, I do appreciate the, the summary. Just a couple things to emphasize here. Um, number one, the reason that we're you know, in this position is because the town people are very generous and that we, you know, we will not allow the students to suffer. And so the local taxes do step up and, and do this. And so you know, a lot of communities they can't afford to have 22 kids in a class or 20 kids in a class. They have 27 kids in a class so that they have, you know, a lo lower, a fewer number of teachers. And so it's really a community decision that we've made. Um, and then I, you, meant, you mentioned on this, but I want to just emphasize a little bit more from what I understand about Chapter 70 funding and, and where it's really fallen short in the past, health insurance in particular and special education. And that is, that is a particular area that I know a lot of people on the school committee past and present really care about. I mean, it's very important that students are able to have an accessible education. And I, I, I pride the district on, on making a commitment to that. And unfortunately, it's what hurts us sometimes for the Chapter 70 funding because we're not getting nearly enough for the amount that we're paying for, you know, certain students that need extra, extra help. But, you know, I think it's, I think we all agree with, you know, the decisions the community has made to, you know, fill the gap <coughs> in. But it's really important to you know talk about why this is happening because we hear all the time like why you know how how your taxes are so high and 
a lot of that's been a commitment by this community to continue to fund education um, at the levels we deem appropriate. So, great. Just my you. little soap. I'll have a couple soap boxes tonight. So there's number one. So. Great. So getting back to where I, um, before we conclude and open it up to discussion, is there is an existing school budget gap. Um, considerable work has has. Uh, taken over the last several weeks to get this budget gap down to a more reasonable number. Um, if you were here at the preliminary presentation, that number was about $1.5 million, I believe. So um, certainly in close collaboration with town officials and the select board and the finance committee and Michael Gilberto, um, town administrator and the work of the finance planning team, which is chairs and vice chairs of the major committees, um, that's been hard at work on a weekly basis over the last several weeks to think creatively and find ways to reduce that budget gap that we kind of go through on an annual basis. We were able to get that difference down to about $430,216. So that's, again, that's, this is, if it wasn't for the, the hard work of that committee and thinking creatively and, and looking to see what we can do, um, the conversation we're about to have, I think would be much, much more difficult. Yes. Me again, Mr. Connolly. So I, I <coughs> I just want to explain because we, we do have people that care here that, you know, take the time to come out to these meetings. And so I, I do want to make sure people understand how we did that. And I don't know if you have a slide on this or not, but. Um, you yeah. might not. But okay. Yeah. So, so, so overall, when you see that, like, oh, why is the revenue so much higher? Or, you know, why is the budget gap different? A lot of this are ways that are not sustainable. You know, we are funding certain one-time expenses from free cash. So for example, snow and ice you know, school retirements, municipal retirements. The reason we have a lower gap is because these expenses should be in the, you know, typically should be in a budget plan and they're in the revenue plan and they're not because they're being funded by, by free cash, which is not something that's sustainable going forward. And so it just, I just think it's worth noting that, like it's not that we magically come up with numbers. Some of this is maybe being a little bit more aggressive in revenue projections on local receipts. But a lot of this are funding things with one-time sources. And then some of the school budget items are specifically being funded, you know, one-time expenses from free cash as well. And so a lot of this, you know, this reduction in the gap comes from one-time sources of funds that we're, we're fortunate to have it right now. And part of this is because we are conservative in our projections so that we generate a lot of free cash year over year and we're able to do this. But it's just a concerning way from a school committee member. It's a concerning way to continue to continue to fund our budget with expenses that we can't always anticipate being there. Yep. Great. Well said. Well said. Great. So again, the, so this was um, the administration's recommendation to try to hide that. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Um, to try to bring things in, into balance. Um, so I'll just kind of walk through, the, through these. The, uh, the first two items were a little bit kind of e easier. We, we often get updated information as we move through the budget process. The budget's released in mid-February, end of February. Um, the original budget, we really at the time weren't too certain what the kindergarten outlook was gonna be in terms of full day offerings and half day offerings. We originally budgeted for three um, potential half-day kindergarten programs at each school, um, requiring a midday transportation run. We now know there's only going to be one uh, need for a midday kindergarten run, so we can make this um, uh, adjustment to the budget, and there's actually a savings to do that. Um, this next line helps fund you know, contractual services for ABA services, you know, speech, language, variety of, of, of student support. Um, areas um, we now because we've had some additional funding this year through through some grants we anticipate that some of our you know grants will roll over with higher balances into next year so this was an adjustment we felt comfortable making and that would have you know very no, no impact on our, our level of services that we're currently servicing students just kind of a line item adjustment based on additional kind of funding and grants and grants and and what we know now exists for transportation and in the half-day kindergarten program. The next five areas, if you may recall, those are all the positions that we were hoping to achieve through our strategic plan um, 
you know, in RPS 2025. So again, not easy to um, put all of these on here as potential um, proposal not to fund these positions to bring the budget into balance as we always like to continue to move the district forward. Um, but again, in looking at the, uh, what we currently have and with the, with the administration's recommendation to the school committee, is we would find it very difficult to kind of reduce areas that we we currently uh, you know do have to try to fund some of these these new initiatives and these are all positions that don't exist today that's why it says new um, although we have you know really worked at trying to think creatively as, as how we could do this um, and not impact any existing services and we'll continue to do that as we move through the next several weeks um, we have kind of ranked these in order of um, of if we were to get additional funding, what would we look to restore first? And that's sort of, a, you know, the, the bottom up. Um, and there's no surprise, we, we mentioned earlier the top priority was the, the adjustment counselors that mental and health, and then the interventionist um, to address learning loss at each, at each level. Um, so if we do come up, and we'll be working hard to do that, and you know, the, we still have until May, May 2nd to officially vote a school budget. Um, if additional funding is identified through additional state revenue or if there happens to be, you know, some savings on the fixed cost scenario uh, as we move through this process, we would look to restore and I think we'd store from kind of bottom up in this order. That would be the, the administration's recommendation to the committee. Um, but I think, I think the other thing I think to, to emphasize is the, the chart that I, I put up a little bit earlier that, re that kind of showed the SR position, so again, if we were not funding those, those four and a half positions um, in next year's budget and then still didn't have access to this funding for these positions, we would be in a much, much different place. But the fact that we still know, at least for next year, and we'll be able to re-look re at this the, for the following year, that we have this 213 or so thousand dollars through fiscal 24 to, to fund you know, this, you know, this, these positions here. Um, but this, this was the recommendation and it would bring the budget um, into balance to get to the $430,216. Um, so just, I will, this is the last slide and I'll kind of turn it over. What can we conclude? So what, what does the FY23 budget accomplish? Some of these areas uh, is accomplishes less because of, of the previous slide if that were to, to happen. Certainly we, we're meeting our contractual obligations with our employees and employee unions. We have to meet our fixed operational costs for a variety of operational needs that increase annually. Um, first and form foremost, we wanted to maintain staffing to protect student-teacher class ratios and class sizes, so that's what those enrollment positions do, and those would be funded through this. Um, and then, obviously, this is part of this is the original budget. We would certainly look into en enhance academic support services social and emotional needs and align the curriculum. So some of these we would not be able to fully achieve if those positions were to be reduced to balance. Um, but the bottom three bullets, we're certainly continuing with our, our district one-to-one -one program, um, continuation with our certainly supplies and materials needed for technology and certainly these, these areas that we still anticipate needs for, for kind of in a post-COVID-19 environment so for supplies and staff devices and software and some help, additional health and sanitation supplies. And then we're, we always want to protect the investment, certainly of this beautiful building, as well as the three um, elementary school campuses. Um, and we believe this, this budget properly funds that to have preventative maintenance measures in place. Um, so again, it's not you know, super fancy budget, but um, you know, this is what, it what we can conclude. And then what, where do we go from here? So we're at the public hearing. Um, the school committee is set to vote on May 2nd. The annual town meeting is on June 6th. You can always follow updates to the budget process on the district website here, um, where all presentations are posted. There's also, there's also, I wanted to mention during the chapter 70 discussion, there's a lot of short videos. So if you want to have a 25 minute presentation on revenue offsets and really get into the weeds of all the federal and state state funding you can watch that and, and see a lot in a lot more detail um, all the revenue sources that are out there and what they're funding um, and then there's actually more on chapter 70 as well 
Um, but this is, these are kind of the next steps. So with that being said, I'll just say thank you and for listening and opening up to, to questions. To the chair. There's a question in the back. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. services and speech and language. Do you mind just elaborating on that? Yeah, so we're not going to reduce any services that we have. Um, we're just, it's more just a transfer to available grant funding that we anticipate being available next year. So it's not going to impact any existing services, but we do carry a line for contractual services to address student support areas. Um, you know, speech and language might be a, a part of that. You know, applied behavioral you know, services for students on the autism spectrum and so forth as a part of that. Um, but it's really, it's not, we're not really reducing any of those services. It's more just a reallocation of, of some funding that was in the general budget over to, to a grant that we uh, know is available next year. So okay. It's not, it's not impacting existing services. Okay. Um, and then also, I just, um, is there any funding for the CPAC? CPAC. Spe uh, special Education so this, yes. Parent Advisory Council. So we do have, we do carry some funding in our, we have for um, the last number of years um, where we do support the cost of the membership. I think it's like the gold membership into that organization. Okay. And then we do support the cost of two speakers a year. Um, so that is what's in our existing budget. It's been there in the, in the past. It's, it's, it's allocated for next year as well. Um, and then I, and so that's what's in our budget. And we just kind of work to hand in hand with that organization. You know, they, they kind of do some fundraising at times. But that, in our local budget, it's, that's what's included. Okay. I'm just a member of the CPAC, so I haven't seen any fundraising for that. And most of the stuff yeah, that, that I've done, I've donated my, out of myself. Um, and so I'm just trying to, I mean, uh, Dr. Daly's gotten some emails in regards to a program that we're trying to bring to the community. So I just wanted to... Ask. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, thank you for, for so we do have the CPAC presenting. Um, I believe it's at our next meeting, mm -hmm. um, and so we can share more. And I, I know that um, I, you're thinking of the curriculum that was shared with parents, and then trying to is that. Yep, the understanding our differences. Yeah. We're working with that, um, partnering with the North Andover CPAC. So I'm on the subcommittee. <laughs> oh, that's great. So we're excited about learning more about that. And then if there was something to pursue, we would have to we would have to identify funding for it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I, I would just like to thank Mr. Connolly. I, 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 I tease you about the length at times, but this was excellent. Very good presentation. Um, I think it's really important to fully understand it. Um, to the comment about CPAC, I'm actually the liaison this year, and so I, you know, I have a child on the, on the spectrum and you know, very much support it. And I think in the past we've spoken with you know, the, the people that run it and, you know, oftentimes if there are speakers like community impact team, there's building funds, there's, there's other ways to do it. Even if the problem is when we're trying to do a budget right now, if we don't know exactly what the programs are, it's also hard to say, this is the program and this is what we need for next year. Um, and that's one of the other challenges here. We're, we're, we're yeah. like, especially with special education where we never know the needs change year over year. And that's one of the biggest problems that we have on the school committee, like this year, I, I, I think it was about two hundred thousand dollars in additional. Was it was two hundred thousand in, tu in tuitions or one hundred fifty? Two hundred like nineteen thousand. But so two hundred and nineteen thousand dollars in out of district tuitions that we had not anticipated in the budget came in this year, and so those are the things that really. I mean, we do we do the best we can to try to pre fund at the end of you know each year, anticipating that some of the sometimes this happens, but it's it, it's a hard hard situation. And I would just add, that's true across the whole budget process. You know, the timing doesn't work out for the school districts at all because, I mean, we won't really know what revenue is available until June, if that, because we, depending on how right. quickly it, the state uh, is able to pass a budget. And, you know, we t you talked about if more revenue becomes available, we'll, re we'll add positions back in, at which point you're trying to hire them in May or June which is well past the start of the hiring season. So it's just, it, it's a difficult process. Um, I just, 
you know, my soapbox is that it's, you know, this is this we did a I, I think the town and the and the school district we did a great job getting to balance on this budget based on what we know now about the revenue sources. But let's be clear, it's a it's a treading water kind of budget. Now the good news is I think we tr have our heads pretty high above water as we're treading. Um, we're not, you know, we're not close to going under yet, but um, it's not a step forward, which is what we always, every year, we hope to take a step forward in our strategic plan uh, and, and add services for students. And uh, this is not a year we're gonna be able to do that, which is, uh, is a shame. But, uh, you know, I think we have our work cut out for us planning for not 2023, but 2024, or I, yeah, yeah, not 2024, but 2025, when that ESSER funding runs out and uh, really determining where all those positions stand and how we're going to fund them. So that's my soapbox. Okay. I have lots of soapboxes. The, 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 the only other thing that I, I want to add to the conversation is just a quick explanation. With the, we, we talk about finance planning team and just sort of what we do, because I don't think everybody always understands that. So when, when Michael Connolly was showing the, or Mr. Connolly was showing the, uh, the general fund, the, there's a lot of different revenue sources that go into one big bucket of money that the town receives. And from that, there's some expenses that come off the top that are shared across with both the municipal and the school side. So we're all in this together and those expenses come off the top. From there, we have to decide how to allocate the money. And we've always, you know, our town has been incredible. I mean, the municipal side has needs as well, fire, you know, the police officers, you know, public service, like DPW, um, you know, youth services, veterans. I mean, there's a lot of people that are struggling to try to provide their services this year as well. And so we usually split it about two thirds to the school district and about a third to the municipal side. So they are in just as bad of a situation as we are right now, but we've had the support where in some communities they have to fight it out on, on the floor of town meeting to try to figure out what percentage of those funds we get. We try to work collaboratively with them and really prioritize where we come from. And so I just, you know, at the public hearing, I just think it's worth noting that we have the collaboration and the, and the support of these people. I mean, in particular, the, you know, the town administrator, Michael Gilberto, town finance director, Liz Rourke, <clears throat> the chair and vice chair of the select board, Kate Minapelli and Leanne Gonzalez, and the chair and the vice chair of the finance committee, Abby Herbert and Dan Mills, we all work collaboratively on this. And so it's it's a hard process and we have to decide on things like funding one time, you know, one time sources of funds, on you know how aggressive to be in local receipts, but it's a it's a shared challenge on on both sides. And so just again, since we're talking about the process, I just think it's worth explaining sort of that's what we're doing in these meetings. We're looking at local revenues every meeting to see what's really happening so we can make, you know, fair and hopefully conservative projections for the coming years. So, Great. But, Very good. Any questions, concerns? And if, yep. it, if anyone's on the on the uh, on on the stream and wants to raise their hand, if you have any questions, yeah. please do. And, and just to understand also, none of this is final yet. So, yep. you know, the School Adjustment Council in particular, I would still love to be able to find the funding to do that. Um, just because when ESSER funds run out, at least we could have funded one position that is in there. I mean, again, this is supposed to be an addition to it, but then we could at least get one of those positions, a regular position into the budget. So I, I still think we're working to try to do that, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Hearing none. Thank you all, Great, thank and we you. will move on. I think we need to. Uh, oh, we have to close. Yes, I need a motion to close the public hearing. I so move. I so second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Four zero to close the public hearing. Thank you, everyone. For taking my soapbox speeches. Um, core measurement survey. You can't have all the Miss Amy Luckowitz, I know you stayed the whole time. Let's go. Do you mind if we would do uh, Ms. Galvin first? Uh, sorry, Amy, we're making you wait longer. Mrs. Miss Galvin, Samantha Galvin, who used to be here. We I remember seeing you. Miss Galvin, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. I'm sure that was very exciting for you, but thank you for staying. <laughs> 
Of course. Um, I think I, I have a presentation to go with it. I don't know if Dr. Daly wants to present that or if I should share my screen. I can, whatever you think is easy. Would you like me to, to share it? Uh, sure. Okay. I will get that up. And um, everyone's received that here. So. Okay, perfect. You can go on to the next slide. So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Samantha, and I used to be a student representative to the school committee during my time at the high school. I also attended North Reading Public Schools from kindergarten through senior year of high school. Um, and now I study art, film, and visual studies and government at Harvard. Um, I have this class called Sophomore Tutorial on Art, Film, and Visual Studies which is basically my key class for my concentration, which is the same as a major. Um, and I'm doing a research paper on creativity as a whole, but really um, the loss of creativity as people age and also um, everyday uh, avenues of creativity and creativity as a tool for handling um, decline in mental health as people age. And in order to kind of get at these issues, I am trying to do my own research and I'm going to survey people from kindergarten through college and I'm really trying to track when the majority of people stop considering themselves as creative or how they are creative, how they aren't creative, um, if they would be pursuing a creative career, if it weren't for other constraints, things like that. Um, if you want to go into the next slide, Dr. Daly. So, these are the data points that I will be collecting. This is just basically all the questions the survey asks. So I'll just go through them quickly. So age, gender, would you consider yourself a creative person? How often do you feel as though you think creatively? Do you think there are any day-to-day -day activities you practice which allow you to express your creativity? How would you feel if you were not allowed to utilize these means of everyday expression? If you have stopped, at what age do you remember stopping playing pretend? Do you wish you had more time to explore your own creativity through which, through what means would you pursue? Do you plan on, are you pursuing a career traditionally thought of to be creative? Would you pursue a career traditionally thought of as creative if money was not a constraint? Would you say you have lost some of your creativity as you have gotten older? If you answered yes on the previous question, why do you think you lost your creative drive? So these are all the questions that the survey asks. And so aside from age and gender, the survey is going to be completely anonymous. I, it's not going to collect emails or names or like geotags or anything like that. Um, and it's going to be completely optional too, because it's going, hopefully, if the committee approves this being sent out, um, going to be sent out to parents for their children to participate in. Um, it's the data will not be published anywhere. It's really just for my class. So my classmates might see it and my professor and my teaching assistant. Um, but the more people that do participate, the more accurate my data will be, um, which will be very helpful for me. And also, you can go on to the next slide too. Um, uh, as I read the questions, there's obviously some that a kindergartner probably wouldn't be able to answer, or a younger student, or even kids that young would probably need a parent to just to read the survey questions to them. So if parents do opt into the survey, I advise them to kind of censor which questions that their kids would answer. Um, but the most important information would be their age and then just the first question, do you consider yourself creative? Um, but yeah, I definitely encourage parents to censor whatever questions they don't want their students answering, but still hopefully to encourage their child to complete it. Um, yeah, that's basically, you can go on to the next slide. It's basically it. If there's any questions, I can answer them, but completing the survey would be very, very helpful for my research. Okay. 
Thank you. Excellent presentation, Samantha. Any questions? Thank you. Thoughts? I have a question. So, wh how many? And what are you are you hoping to have this survey taken across all you know a lot of ages? Or how how are you accessing other age groups? Yeah. So it's just kindergarten through um, college age. So. For college, I just sent it um, across some email like lists that we have access to through our dorm kind of grouping. Um, and I got a good amount of answers that way. I'm gonna send it out to like some teams that I'm a part of, clubs I'm a part of. So honestly, the like older age group isn't um, that hard to target. Um, but as far as like a younger age group, yep. that's why I came to like present today, hoping that I would get enough data from North Reading Public Schools, and if I can't, I might extend it to different public schools in the Cambridge area. Dr. Daly? I just wanted a nice presentation, Samantha, and she and I have been exchanging some emails trying to craft this. I, my understanding is that the superintendent can approve um, this would be a technically a third-party survey, and I, I, I don't believe we've done this very often, having um, outside groups or students or you know, former students to participate. I thought this was a, a topic of interest that, um, you know, I, I think, I know that the data is not going to be shared, but would you be able to share the data with us, Samantha, at the end, or, or some of the... Or at least yeah, recordings? I could share it with the school. The I just figured, like, findings. parents might not want their, ch like, children's data, even though it won't contain no, their name, absolutely. to be, yeah, like, published anywhere. Absolutely. I'm saying the disaggregated findings, you know, might be interesting mm -hmm. from the entire study, not just from our data. Um, but yeah. so it is something I consider. Obviously, we can't do this every single time we get a request, but they're few and far between. I thought it was worth bringing forward to deliberate in, in public. And I, I have also let Samantha know that you know surveys in general are coming under a lot of scrutiny. So I, I like the transparent process with this in our next item um, to talk about and um, and to just get some thoughts from the committee. And and a couple questions for me, just to first and foremost, what's the timeline on this? If assuming that we support it tonight. What would be the timeline in collecting data? I was hoping like basically a week, so by next Monday. Okay, and that, and, and in terms of the process, would this just be a district-wide email that went out? That's 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 what I decided. Uh, I thought would be the best process. It's a it's a tight timeline. Um, I think in the future we'd want a lot more time and those things. But this um, came together kind of quickly. We got it on the agenda for tonight. Um, parents would be sent an email. Samantha has some supporting materials. I, I, I think she's gonna get the best return rate if she explains that she's a former North Reading graduate um, and that she's working on a project and, and she could really use some help. And um, I think if people um, do that and we send it out, um, she will get a, a, a decent return rate. We can't you know, require, we're not gonna take class time for it even though I do think it's a valid study, but we, we have so many other things that we are taking class time for. Um, and, and so, we would move follow those parameters. And my last question is more for Dr. Daly, but um, I know that when you sign up to get emails from the school, you can you can kind of opt into certain different emails. I wonder if there should be a category for surveys where if you want to participate them in the, in the future, yeah. we could just sort of say, and then there'd be a, a set data segment that have already identified that they'd be interested in participating in, in various surveys rather than rather than having to go through it for each individual one and trying to, because the only concern I have is if we're choosing one over the other. Right. And so if we had a, a process by which we set up, you want to do a survey, if you're a past student or whatever the process is, and then we have a specific segment of people that have already opted into potentially doing surveys, just, just a thought for the future. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I've thought about that a lot. Again, this hasn't happened a lot yep. in my understanding. so. <laughs> If we start to get more requests, I think we absolutely would need a process. I'm looking at this almost like a, a trial to see yep. how it goes. And, and if we get even a return rate this way, I have thought about just putting it on the community bulletin board, which people have subscribed to. But I, I feel like um, it might be worth to, to see how we how we do that. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess the last one. And so, and just to be clear, you are sending it out, so we're not giving all the information, the private information on emails to. Samantha, no, it would no. be going through. I would just be sending, I would be forwarding her link and yep. respectfully asking anyone that wants to support this uh, to support it. And, yep. and um, okay. There is a question from the public. Yes, go ahead. Ms. Kepke, you've joined us and raised your hand. Julie? Julie Kepke. 
Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe she can't hear us. She's raising the roof. Just okay. Now, Julie, do you want to type in any question? Uh, the chat's turned off. It gets disabled oh. at this point. Well, can she unmute herself? Is she able to unmute herself? She should be able to. She can yeah. She can email the questions. We can try to get it. Yep. <laughs> OK. So, Julie? Yeah, sorry. There was a issue with my audio and permissions. Huh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. So my question is, what format? Is it a Google form? Is it a Survey Monkey? What exactly will be sent out? Yep. Samantha? Currently, it is a Google form because Google Forms automatically will turn it into a spreadsheet, which makes it easier to then do statistical analysis on. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Dale, you're not looking specifically for a vote and approval or you're just looking for our, our, our comments and comments and recommendation my my understanding is it's a superintendent's decision and okay. so it would be a, a you know I, and I just want to discuss it publicly and get your input so okay. you could vote to recommend that i approve or vote to recommend that okay we don't, we don't go down this direction <laughs> chris any thoughts before you when you're when you're there um <clears throat> excuse me thank you uh no, it sounds like an interesting uh, survey. I I share Mr. Buckley's thoughts that um, having some sort of streamlined process to let parents kind of massively opt in or opt out of this sort of thing saves us having to cherry pick which ones seem good. But uh, looking at it like Dr. Daly painted it as a pilot program, I think this is this is great. It's a nice survey to have. It's going to be interesting data. I know personally, I'd be interested to see the general results of the entire enterprise, and I think it's a it's an interesting project, so thanks for sharing it with our town. Ms. Zimbriano. Oh, you know me. <laughs> um, no, I just, I think it's it's interesting as well, and I would also like to see what the um, outcome is on it, so I hope it goes forward for you. Mr. McGowan. I, I have no objections. Um, again, agree with your the, the idea of putting a structure in place, but uh, in the meantime, I think this is a good place to start. And so I, I, I also approve. Um, so, is like a formal vote, or is that sufficient for now? Good discussion today. Thank okay, you. perfect. So we are four zero in favor of it, Great. Samantha. So good luck on it, and hopefully you get a lot of responses. Thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Samantha. Good to see you. Good to see you guys too. Okay. Can is there anybody we can jump ahead of Amy? <laughs> Anybody to go ahead of Amy Luckowitz? Okay, hearing none, I guess we're to Miss Luckowitz. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it is that time of year where I, I come to speak before you guys about collecting our core measurement, but I just uh, do want to take a second, as a lot of people have tonight, to uh, recognize Mrs. Ambriano who has been on our uh, drug-free coalition for several years now as a very active member and has helped us a great deal in pushing things forward and new initiatives. So thank you. You're, of course, welcome to stay on the coalition, uh, given your time. Um, and I, I hope that Dr. Daly was able to um, share with you the time that we spent in Charlotte at the four day um, intensive training. And um, it, it was he was a big hit. Um, he was the first superintendent that's ever attended uh, one of these events. And obviously, everybody had questions for him. But it was it was such a great um, a big deal for us so talk about showing commitment to our our project and keeping north reading drug free and preventing substance abuse among kids it was a huge deal um just for the good of the group too you know the community impact team and our specifically our federal grant is happy to subsidize um some of the programs that that do go on in the schools um uh, i know shibby today mentioned lynn lyon's presentation that was um co-opted with the with the parent association we were happy to contribute some funds to that um and also, you know, we have contributed to CPAC presentations in the past, too, and happy to continue doing that. We are funded for uh, four more years moving forward. Um, so I believe, uh, Dr. Daly, does everybody have a copy of the current survey? They do. I okay, great. The most recent version today. There's yep. a back and forth, we're making adjustments. Yep. Very good. Okay, so the primary purpose of collecting this information is to um, 
th this is really the only measurement that we have about how well we do with prevention efforts related specifically to four substances, um, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, prescription drugs, but uh, we separated out tobacco into vaping as its own category. Uh, we've decided to do that. The feds don't do that. We do that because it does have its own behaviors and around it. So we separate out into five categories. We're required to collect five, uh, excuse me, four questions about each substance, past 30 day use, perception of risk or harm, what they think their parents think if they would were to find out their student was using that substance and what would their friends think if they were to find out um, if they were using those substances. Those are the required questions. But as you know, we've partnered with the school committee over the years uh, in the public schools about collecting additional information. Um, this year's does continue to do that around climate information. Uh, um, Mrs. Molly mentioned earlier social emotional data about safety, how uh, kids are feeling. And then also um, to continue collecting information around sleep. This is something that um, I believe continues to be advantageous to collect information on that as the school times did change. So let's see, you know, if the kids are, are actually um, getting more sleep and how that's affecting them. Um, I won't, I, I think you all have that in front of you. So I'm going to leave it open to questions. If you, the, the administration is going to be left, uh, the administration schedule, I should say, is left up to the school principals. My understanding is that they all have copies of a letter that will go be sent to parents ahead of time. Um, parents are allowed to review the survey ahead of time, of course. They can opt out. In addition, as we always have allowed, students are allowed to start and stop the survey whenever they choose and skip questions. The only question they cannot skip is um, what grade they are in. Okay, thank you very much. So, Dr. Daly first. I'll just add that we have, uh, this would be done during school time. We would be allotting time during, I believe, homeroom uh, at the middle school, an extended homeroom period. Um, the ninth and 10th grade would be able to take it in their uh, health, wellness, phys ed blocks, and we would utilize power block, I believe, for 11th and 12th grade. It will be done, the, the principals are hoping to send it out, um, a copy of the survey so parents can review it, make the decision to opt out over the next few days and then they would take it soon after when they return. So it wouldn't take a lot of time off of uh, learning, but the data, as, as Ms. Luckwitz mentioned, is very, very important to us to um, drive the work we're doing in the community. And, and because it's taking away from class time, should we vote officially for this one or not? I, I think we should. Yeah, I think, I think we have voted on this one yeah. before. I know we have voted in the past, but. Um, Mr. Buckley, I should add that the current, um, this is uh, the mode, just so everybody knows, is going to be done through SurveyMonkey. And the cool thing about that technology is it estimates the amount of time each survey will take, and it's around eight to nine minutes per survey, if that's wow. helpful. So questions from the committee. Mrs. Imbriano. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell everyone how many years we've been collecting this. I'm sorry, you have been collecting this data. <laughs> we, we, um, sure. So I, this will be, we're in year six of the grant, but this will be, um, this mode will be the seventh year that we've done this because we had to collect some pre-data as well. Um, I also should have mentioned as well that the school committee gets first uh, view of the data and then it does get shared publicly. Past data results are available on the CIT website at northreadingma.gov slash CIT. We make that information public. Um, and just to remind everybody too that last year's numbers, 2020 obviously was not a very valid year for us. We didn't have students in school. 2021, we did see a pretty large decline in substance uses. And I just want to make everybody aware that we're likely to see a little jump in numbers this year as students are back face to face. The peer pressure um, element comes back into play. And I don't want anybody to be discouraged by that. We are anticipating that. Yeah, oh, that, that was my main question or comment is how, how, how you're going to anticipate the data. But um, OK, Mr. McGowan, any co comments? Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, this has been a good survey over the years, and I'm glad to have it continue. Thank uh, you. Mr. Papa Vasilio, any questions, comments? No, not at this time. So my my. My thoughts, other than COVID results, are first and foremost, thank you, um, Ms. Luckowitz, for coming. I would just like to point out that the reason we have these funds is because of Amy. Um, I mean, she, I think she sort of single handedly did the grant to get this. And so, and then I believe renewed it and, and got it a second time, correct? Yes, thank you very much. And so, I mean, again, it's just, it, it's important data to have, and it, it's good that we have it. It's just another thing that is funded by 
grants outside of the normal, you know, budget that we we have. Um, the other and and this is this is required for part of the grant. Is that correct? Is it a requirement of the, the grant? Four questions per um, four questions per substance are required. We go beyond that to collect information that's relevant to the school system. Okay. So for the for getting the grant, we sort of have to approve this anyways, <laughs> or you have to at least get some way to get this data. Um, yeah. And the only other request is when you come in. I think one of the most influential things I've ever had on the school committee is when you taught me about vaping. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would love for when you come in again to uh, teach us something again, because it's invaluable information. I mean, and, and I've, my wife was watching that night and I, don't know, I just think it's a really interesting presentation when you, uh, when oh, you well, come. thank you. I'm, I will throw it on your radar that um, we do have a couple of in plane sites going on with the police department coming up in May as well as some parenting programs called the 40 Developmental Assets. But to throw on your radar on that exact point, Mr. Buckley, if you wanna Google Delta 8 THC, it's known as light weed or diet weed. And that is something that we're looking very closely at um, as the next up and coming along with Kratom, K-R-A-T-O-M, Kratom, or as they call it down south, Kratom. Okay. So there you go, I'll, I'll, we'll be talking about that. Okay. Dr. Nailers. I, I believe I, I shared this be, uh, previously, but I'll just say again with Amy here. We, I, I had a, a great experience going down to this um, to this conference. I learned so much. I learned so much in every substance abuse meeting. I'm always writing down new things that are coming out. and um, It's great how Amy and the, the police department and the schools and all of our community partners really work so closely together on these issues. Um, it was, it was eye-opening for me to see um, you know, communities from around the country, rural Utah, with 800 uh, population in the entire town, to, to cities in the south in Georgia with 20,000 uh, in the schools, um, but yet a common denominator, we're all facing some of these same challenges with, with, with opioids, with marijuana, with vaping, and just seeing how we can share with each other to share strategies and, and to learn together was really a powerful experience. So I. I, I certainly was happy to be there to, to show the commitment of the schools to this program. Um, but I just want to, again, commend Ms. Luckwitz for her great work and efforts in the town. Thank because you. Um, the, like every town, we, we have issues to address. And this data helps us really focus. That, that's what the focus of our group was around coming up with the strategic planning for this. And I'm going to be, it, it actually, you know, we, we've included some language explicitly into our strategic plan to talk about um, some of the health initiatives. Too. Enough. which I'm thrilled about. And I, I think this is the strongest we've ever been with the collaboration between the community, the schools, and the police department. It's, it's, it's so encouraging. I was just going to say, it's, not a, it's great that you went, Dr. Daly, and it's also great that you felt like you could find the time to go. Yeah, uh, not easy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my last point, just to uh, Ms. Luckowitz, is randomly at finance planning team, when we were talking about funding sources, what came up in the last meeting was the opioid settlements that are that are starting to come out. And I just think it, it's interesting and I think it's important that, I'm, I'm sure you'll be on top of this, but talking about how North Reading gets the funds that are allocated. And some of them I think are specifically allocated to us and some of the other ones may be allocated, but by grant. And so I just think important that we all have that on our radar because even some of the school needs, you know, adjustment counselors, some of those positions are interrelated at times with, with abuse and, you know, substance abuse. And so I think, I think you'll be a key part of helping us to secure some of those funds as well. I'm so glad you brought this up. I actually had a preliminary discussion with Chief Murphy about this today. Um, and tomorrow, you know, Dr. Daly will be part of our community impact team uh, leadership team meeting in the morning. And it is hopefully going to be a brief discussion on the agenda because nothing has really been identified about a timeline yet. But uh, rest assured is very much on my radar as well. Uh, Marcy Bailey is a huge advocate for this as well, even though she's not living in North Reading any longer. You know, she's definitely keeping it on our radar. You haven't kicked Marcy off yet? <laughs> no, I'm not going to either. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Any other comments, discussion? So can I have a motion to approve the core measurement survey? So moved. I have a second. Second. Okay. We'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes four to zero. Thank you again, everybody. And I'll be sure to report all the information that we get.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for hanging in. No problem. Have a good night, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, moving on, we're going to talk about the food service contract and hopefully approve this. Mr. Connolly, are you going to? I, I will introduce because he's going to talk about it, but this has all been led by Mr. Connolly. He has done a ton of work. Dr. Daly participated as well, but, you know, it, I did almost nothing on this. This is, <laughs> this is purely Mr. Connolly's work, um, and he should get all credit for this, but go ahead, Mr. Connolly. <laughs> So I'm happy to uh, report this evening that the administration and school committee liaison, Mr. Buckley, have, have reached an agreement with the food service workers in New York Reading, whose current contract expires um, on June 30th. Um, so uh, highlighted in the, the, the new agreement would be a three-year term from July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2025. Um, the agreement does include an 8% cost of living adjustment over the next three years, around 3% in year one, 3% in year two, and 2% in the final year. Um, the agreement also includes a, a rather um, extensive restructuring of their existing hourly rate schedule that would roll in other benefits as, that are part of the contract um, for vacation pay, holiday pay, um, longevity stipends, and clothing allowance uh, pay as well. Um, so I, I, I think it was, I was just really pleased with the, the collaboration of um, you know, both sides on the table with the food service workers. They, they certainly um, were able to, to listen and, and work with us to collaboratively come up with what we feel is a compensation structure that I think meets the needs of, of both sides. Um, the administration as well as I think in, in the long term something that would be certainly beneficial to the food service employees that certainly recognizes them for the great work that they have done um, certainly over the, the last number of years but it, uh, more importantly the, the last two years um, you know like many of the, the employees in, in North Reading they've been able to to uh, go above and beyond and, and do their job even, even differently than, than what they've, than the way they've always done it, with the, the packaging and the grab and go and everything that's kind of been asked of them, they, they've risen to the occasion every step of the way over the last two years. Um, so it, in a lot of ways, I think the end result is a, a compensation package that's, that's very professional, um, that streamlines and simplifies the, the benefits and compensation um, that, that have always been a part of the contract by, by making it part of their hourly base. Um, and it also, in a lot of ways, uh, allows um, the, the new hourly rate structure with some of those, these, these rolled in benefits to be a, a highly competitive um, hourly rate um, salary table that the district believes, the administration believes, will allow us to continue to attract, recruit, and ret retain um, you know, highly skilled employees in this area, which has been a challenge during, during the pandemic. Um, we fortunately have never gotten to the point where we had to impact services, but I think a lot of districts in the area um, got to that point, and, and I think this certainly sets us up where we're gonna be in a situation where we can attract, um, recruit, and retain highly qualified staff, and I think it appropriately recognizes them for their work and, and keeps the hourly rate scale very competitive um, with other um, demographics uh, or our peers in comparable communities in this area. Um, so I, I just was very pleased with the, the openness um, in the, by the food service employees and their, their willingness to kind of look at things a little bit differently. Um, and I think it was a really, really good process. And I believe um, it's, the, it's the end result is um, really works for both the administration and the workers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Connolly. Any questions on the contract? I, I, I will just add a few things. I'd like to thank the uh, food service workers, yep. um, their representatives that, that took the time to come in and meet with us. And, you know, as I said, Mr. Connolly and, and Dr. Daly for doing this. Um, the structure, I think, will also be very helpful, It'll, both for the district to save, you know, some time, but also 
the way that it was before was just if if food service were if, if the school wasn't in session for you know April break, people wouldn't get paid, and you know if they had health insurance, they actually owed money back to the district at times because if they didn't have days to take, and so it's just um, I think it's a much better way of doing this. We've talked a couple different times at how uncompetitive our wages were in the past. We had to actually make an adjustment in the middle of the last contract because we were lower than minimum wage. And while technically we were allowed to be under minimum wage, nobody on this committee thought that we should be below minimum wage. And go figure, we weren't attracting candidates for open positions because we weren't even paying minimum wage in the state. And so I think, you know, trying to, you know, get a, a fair wage to people who work really hard. And I think the food service workers did a tremendous job throughout COVID. Um, it was a big change. We talk about the teachers needing to teach, you know, electronically. It was a big change for how they prepare foods and everything as well. And so I think they've done an excellent job. I'm, I'm happy that we're able to do something for them. I think it's very important in this town to have contracts signed with all of your unions. That is one of the functions of the school committee is to make sure that we do have contracts with the, with the unions here. And so I'm very happy that we were able to do it. And it was a very easy process because of the people that were leading the negotiations. So, Dr. Daly. Just, just to echo that, a very collaborative process, wonderful working with them, and they, as you said, doing a tremendous job, handing out lunches outside in the cold last year to all the different preparation methods. They do a great job every day. And we're very happy to have a fair and, and a collaborative process. Okay. Um, I will move. Coming? Okay. I'd like. Yes, a motion to approve the I move that the okay. school committee vote to approve the food service worker contract reached for fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 25 as presented and recommended by the administration. Well said. Second. Okay. Well written by <laughs> Michael, I suspect. Um, okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an eye as well. Passes four to zero. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Minutes. Do we have anything for minutes? No. Budget update, Mr. Connolly. There, there is a um, FY22 uh, current fiscal year budget update and report um, for the, the month of March, or it summarizes financial activity through the month of March. Um, certainly, been speaking many uh, about many of the, the drivers and the factors at play throughout the fiscal year. Um, I think there's at this point, as we really are into the final quarter of fiscal year 22. The district does still remain in very solid financial standing. Um, as I've mentioned previously, there's certainly been some unanticipated costs that have, have arisen in, in areas of special education, and at times in areas to address some, some maintenance items and make written repairs. Um, but because we took some steps at the end of last fiscal year to, to prepay some, some tuition costs that we are allowed to do so, and um, we've been able to do and, uh, and address these areas that came up um, all within budgeted ranges. Um, certainly the, the payroll accounts as reflected in the report have certainly um, maintained and are, are forecasting all within budget. Uh, we just talked about the food service uh, workers and contract and that program continues to perform well. Participation in the program this year continues to be at or above 50% across the district. Um, so there's certainly going to be a lot of work to do over the final quarter of the fiscal year to have a successful closeout. But again, as I mentioned earlier, I think things are trending well and we are in, in good financial standing. That I will not any questions. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Any questions? A rarity, I have none. Okay, let's move on. Thank you. Phew. Donations. <laughs> Donations. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of five boxes of hot and cold packs valued at $1,200 from North Reading resident Greg Imbriano to benefit all schools and offices across the district. That was nice of Mr. Imbriano. It was nice. <laughs> Not my Mr. Imbriano, but um, I'll second. <laughs> okay, we have a second. And any discussion? I guess I have to do a roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 4-0. Thank you, Mr. Imbriano. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation in the amount of $455 from the North Reading High School Music Boosters 
for the payment of the, of the notorious fan bus to the state finals in Worcester, Massachusetts. I'll second that. Any discussion? Rich? Aye. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an eye as well. Passes 4 0. It was the fan bus for the notorious group, not the. It's not that the fan bus itself was notorious, just to clarify. Yeah, <laughs> could be. I haven't heard any reports, so. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude various donations in the amount of $380 from North Reading parents to benefit the, no, the, the notorious New York trip at the high school. I'll second that. Any discussion? Rich? Aye. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an eye as well. Passes four to zero. And finally, I think, yep, finally, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of audio and visual equipment, including a green screen, LCD projector, digital camera, a brother printer, extra bulb for the projector, et cetera, valued at $1,153.99 from North Reading resident Frank Potvin to benefit the audio visual department at the high school. I'll second that. Any discussion? Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an eye as well. Passes four to zero. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Thank you, everybody. <coughs> just, just one note. It, yes. I think the, the middle school will also benefit. It does say high school there, but I know that um, both, both departments will be very grateful for this. Very good. Items. Subcommittee updates. Finance planning came. We the, I think we've seen the results. <laughs> we we seen, made some good yeah. progress. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and again, like. I, it's a great you've heard everything and it's a great process yes it, it really is a great group to be to be with um subcommittee schedule athletic subcommittee is scheduled to meet on april 13th at noon finance planning team is scheduled to meet april 29th at 8 a.m fine arts subcommittee is scheduled to meet may 25th at 3 15 p.m administrative report dr daly sure just a few items i, I did want to share um <coughs> as as has been mentioned a few times we do have the uh, Notorious performing at the, the national finals in New York City, um, and there is a there are various fundraisers going on. There's a concert uh, this Thursday evening, and I believe the tickets are ten dollars if they're purchased in advance and fifteen at the door to support uh, Notorious moving forward. Um, I'm I'm very excited. I bought a ticket. I'm actually going to go see them and, and uh, bring the family. So I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to cheer them on. They've they, this is a, a tremendous tremendous accomplishment to be one of the top ten in the country. So. I'm very excited for that. Multiple countries. It's Canada, UK, and US, right? This is true. Um, the, as I shared earlier, um, I will be sharing out tomorrow um, about ha having an equity, diversity, inclusion forum for parents on uh, May 11th at 7 p.m. This is really intended for North Reading families uh, and parents, not um, the entire world to come. This is really a discussion for parents of students in our community. Uh, to be here to learn and to clarify, really to clarify misunderstandings and understand what truly is a part of our program here in North Reading and not um, a lot of misinformation that's out there as I addressed earlier this evening. Is this going to be a Google Meet in person? This is going to be in person. I, I purposely have avoided doing Google Meets um, with this topic and I, I do want it to be in person. So okay. unfortunately I may need to, to you know, think a little bit differently about how I plan it based on um, Tonight. Based on some concerns I have at the moment, but, but I, I think that we can certainly um, move forward. We've received um, many emails from parents who are concerned about things they're hearing at the meetings, um, parents who want to work with us. I've met with the student groups, um, both the, the GSA advisors as well as the uh, Student Activism Club, because I, I really want students to hear directly from me um, how we feel and how we respond and that we have their backs and that I want to hear their concerns, and they have uh, they have concerns, and I'm meeting with those groups to share. And I want the the families and the students who feel um, that they want to come and speak and ask questions to be comfortable on all sides of the issue, right? And I, I want I want to be able to um, purposefully and um, you know collaboratively ne negotiate um, how we discuss. But it's that is not going to be a public meeting. That's my meeting. Um, it's going to be run that way. This is not an official public meeting. This right. is my meeting, and, and I'm going to be in control of running that meeting. I've asked um, our, our equity, diversity, inclusion um, coordinator, Miss India Barrows, to be there as well. I'm not sure if she's available yet, but we are hoping that she's there that evening. 
and it's the first of, of, of many things that are coming out. We did have another um, concerning incident at the little school. And, and again, we're not overreacting, we're not underreacting. We have uh, concerning issues. We're going to bring it forward. We're going to support um, the idea of zero tolerance and that we don't, we will acknowledge an incident no matter how small. And we will let everyone know that we don't accept that and we're going to continue to um, follow the handbooks and provide discipline as necessary and we're going to move forward. But I think it's important to step back and frame what we are doing in the schools and parents certainly have the right to come to public meeting and challenge curriculum, but they do not have the right to um, change it, opt out, um, or, or um, make demands uh, of, of teachers or schools to to disallow things that are in the curriculum. They certainly have a right to come and share their, their thoughts, and I think we we will hear more of that. But I, I certainly welcome all views. And on, on, that, on that point, if I may, Dr. Daly, very yeah. quick. Um, I know any any incident involving you know racial language um, needs to be investigated. I mean, I think the last meeting there was discussions about hoaxes. I mean, I think we have to investigate everything. But on the other end, we also hear from people that think that zero tolerance means we expel a, a student the first time they use a certain word. And I just think it's important to understand that children are children. They need to be educated and you know. Kicking them out of public school, to me, is not educating them. And we need to take everything serious, but at the same time, understand that children make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And so I just think it's important to say that, I, and, and I would just say that, like, I mean, I support, I think your communication on these issues has been excellent. Um, I don't always know exactly what com comes from them. The community members aren't going to know exactly what discipline came from them. But we also have to remember that this is education, and people make mistakes sometimes when they're learning. So. That's a great point. And it's similar to you know, when there's a school safety issue, we certainly report out um, you know, as much as we're allowed to under the law. So I would go over some of that process that evening as well. Your comment? Um, Ms. Clody has a comment. Mrs. Cloney? Sorry, Scott. I don't even know if I'm technically allowed to be in here. So if you need to kick me out, you can kick right. me out. Nope. Go ahead. Uh, Jump in. Um, because I don't know if you closed the meeting, but I didn't get kicked out, so I couldn't tell if we were in closed session or not. No, nope. but I guess I would just I, I would just say to you, Scott, um, that or to the group, I think I don't disagree, and I'm all for education, but I think that we have to also remember that when we say like kids will make mistakes and kids will learn it's not i you know i've had this conversation a few times now doing nothing is not being neutral sometimes doing not suspending a kid or not expelling a kid you're making it so other kids have a hard time accessing their also right to public education so i think that's important to remember that sometimes when we continue to give chances to kids who um who are making education harder for other kids? We're not, we're not, we're hurting those kids who have been um, bullied. It's not like letting the kids stay has no negative consequences for those kids. I, I agree, and, and and at the end of the day, I think that if there are, is repetitive behavior, there are, you know, there are consequences. But there's also there's also a system in place to decide on the appropriate punishment for the incident. And we have to take into account all of the various factors of that. And I think that from the incident, from what I know of them, and from the communication I've seen from the administration, I feel like they've been handled appropriately from what I've seen. And I just wanna say to Dr. Daly when he's addressing those that you know, I support the communication that has come from the district so far. And then just to clarify, yeah, go ahead. And, and just again, um, I, I do understand that point, but again, there's due process laws that apply for students. There's um, student confidentiality that we can't reveal. And there's, um, you know, we, we always follow the laws. We follow what's in our handbooks as far as this. So. Yep. Mr. McGowan, you look like you're gonna say something. I am. Um, I, just, to, just to sort of follow up on it, um, not on the specific incidents, but on things we heard earlier tonight um, and what you're hearing from students and um, um, members of the community you know 
we've chosen to treat what's happening in public comment a certain way, um, but I, I think it's important for me to say at least that, you know, Dr. Daly, you and the administration and the and the principals and the teachers have our have my support in the way you're handling <coughs> those types of instances and the way we're developing the curriculum uh, in in all areas and uh, the community should know that you have my support. I don't want to speak for the committee here, but uh, that that you have you know my support and I suspect other support in in all those areas. It's a little difficult because we're choosing not to respond, and I think that's the right choice because they're. The subjects that come up are not really anything that has anything to do with what's going on in North Reading in most cases. So, um, but just wanted to make that clear, at least for my own self. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm just going to call on Mrs. O'Mara as well. Okay. So, Kristen O'Mara, um, I just have a general um, question, I guess. So there's obviously like a lot of, we get the emails from Dr. Daly, which is great communicating when situations happen. Um, but is there any way we can maybe put out like a general review of like what our discipline level looks like? Because I know we have like a zero tolerance policy. I'm sure you guys take care of it. But from the parents view, like we're kind of like, oh, something happened. And then obviously we believe you're dealing with it, but we don't know what's going on. And I get there's privacy issues and all of that. But I think for our parents, for our teachers, everyone, if you could do like a general kind of view on that, I think that would be beneficial to a lot of people. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's part of what I plan to do that evening on the 11th because I want to do it similar to the way we did the school safety summit because it's, it's honestly, it's a lot of the same slides. It's, it's very, the very same similar. information that applies. Um, that worked well for that. A lot of people were concerned. How do we need to know? We need to know what the, you know, how can we move forward? How do we know what's happening? I have to be able to frame that. And, and yep. it, it's, when I say, you know, it's in the handbooks very clearly what the I'm sure it definitely is. is. It's just, I'm sure we haven't read it. <laughs> some time just to go over that and yeah. clarify. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of misinformation out there, so I want to clarify exactly what is allowed and what we are doing. So that's part of what we're going to go over that evening. But I, I do appreciate that that's, that's a need. I think that's just like a general. We don't need like, you know, personal information, anything like private, just yeah. straight general of that. Yeah, as much as people yeah. want that information, you know, the easiest thing to think about is just, just for a moment, picture that it's your child who's the alleged uh, aggressor. And what information you'd be comfortable having everybody in the town know. oh absolutely so and, and and just understand that the laws are there and the, the standards for expulsion are extremely extremely high legally so you know but a zero tolerance meaning we will not we will absolutely address it in accordance with the handbook and provide provide appropriate discipline and monitor it and, and make sure that there's there's not a, you know student uh, retaliation and all of those pieces that's all part of our plan and program yeah so we'll go over that a little bit as well Thank you. I, I think that'd be great. Absolutely. Dr. Daly, I haven't seen a, a lot of the communication, just, just some of it. Um, yeah. But I wonder if um, having some bullet points on that, on that topic handy to put into the specific case incidents, uh, communications, uh, just as a reminder to people, you know, yeah. going forward, here's what will happen and, and here's yeah. why you won't hear, you know, exactly what the result <coughs> is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more administrative report? Yes. Um, so I just wanted to share this with you. When I, when I looked through the school committee policy, there's actually not anything directly that um, addresses student dress codes or student appearance updates. Um, the way it leads in the school committee policy is it's up to the principals to make their decisions. Um, and, and looking at our three different levels, um, the elementary uh, dress code actually already is very similar to the way this uh, language is written. Um, but we've had students, uh, quite honestly, lead this uh, conversation with our, with our middle school and high school administration. Um, there's a lot of evidence that um, the traditional dress codes that we think about can be um, sexist, it can promote all kinds of uh, negative things, and so the students have been very articulate uh, in bringing that forward. And so um, I just wanted to read and share um, some of the language from, from uh, the high school handbook, which the middle school is looking at something similar. And just to have a, a, br a brief discussion about it, and if there's anything else that you'd like, whether it's a presentation or more information. But they, this, this work really falls under the handbooks, which falls under the site councils and the school councils at each school, which have stakeholder representatives of parents, teachers, administration. On them. Um, but the most current draft that's being considered at this time 
Um, students are expected to keep themselves appropriately attired at all times and in addition are expected to comply with reasonable requests from school personnel. Any clothing or jewelry promoting behavior that is deemed harmful by school administration is prohibited. Also, shoes and appropriate footwear must be worn at all times. Any clothing articles prohibited if it is deemed obscene, profane, lewd, or vulgar, or if it is deemed to harass, threaten, intimidate, or demean an individual or group of individuals because of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, gender, identity, age, disability, or sexual orientation. Violation of the above shall be handled immediately through the cooperation of the student, his or their parents, and the school administration. The administration reserves the right to determine the appropriateness of clothing within the guidelines provided. Such a determination shall be made in coordination with the school's district goals for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Any comments, thoughts? This has happened for a while. I do. The dress code thing. I remember when yeah. my young'uns were in the middle school. Um, actually, I remember the footwear thing being because someone wore flip-flops at the hood school and a heavy piece of um, like rolled paper had fallen and smashed their toe. So that was, gosh, <laughs> a while ago. Um, yeah, but the dress code thing has <clears throat> been something that's been around for a while. In many ways, we, we operate. Um, under this kind of a dress code that it's really it's, it's a reasonableness discussion it gives the leverage to the administrator to make the decision when you start getting into delineating you can't wear this you can't wear this you can't wear that that's when it starts getting into areas that that are of concern because mm -hmm. it's well, why are you allowing that article but you're not allowing this one why you know and, and trends change and, um, and and different things happen and then you're constantly trying to update it with what kids are wearing these days or whatnot whereas a, a a more generic language that just says here's what's not allowed and we're going to have a, we're going to have a conversation about what, what's reasonable um, and th there are certain things that are allowed under under free speech um, which we've been down that road but I think these uh, obviously these protected categories um, that would cause or cause an issue at school is a different story and so um, that's why this is being presented that way. Chris I'm told that you have your hand up yep um so yeah i you know i appreciate a couple things uh first that as dr daly said that some of this is really coming from the kids i think that's anytime that they're seizing ownership over the norms and the culture of the school i think it's a great thing and and i can really understand without needing specifics how having something that's overly delineated can can really create problems uh, especially as kids are kind of figuring out ways to express themselves. Uh, but I do want to point something out, which is that if you go too far the other way, if it becomes too broad or too generic, not only does it become a little easier for people to implement it or, um, or kind of punish things that maybe you weren't expecting, but it also gets trickier for the kids to know what is and isn't allowed. They might not have a fully formed idea of what is reasonable or appropriate, or they might have different differing views on, on what that is based on how they view the world so that's that's i don't i don't think we're going too far in making things broad and generic but that is the danger of going too far down that path and i just wanted to point that out i i, I might add something to that that uh, you know what's so important is how it gets addressed and and how you know hopefully it gets addressed privately not publicly uh, i think that's where i'm in in things that i can think of in the past that i've I've witnessed that that's where when it could really cause problems we have very strong administrative team who has good relationships with the students there's trust um, I think everyone's willing to you know have these discussions and have these meetings and this is a ongoing process but the administration listened to the concerns of the students and the parents that brought it forward and as I mentioned this is really how we've been operating um, and this is more of a reassurance to everyone that we're going to follow. Let's let's put into our handbooks what we're actually doing, um, and, and let it continue to be successful. So we don't anticipate that there's going to be a huge change. There's not a huge problem one way or the other, but we did identify um, when the students brought it forward that some of the language in there could be problematic and could be um, causing more issues than it's worth when it's actually not what we've been doing. So okay. we. Um, we feel that this is a good step. I always think aligning your policies, or in this case, the handbook, with what you're actually doing is always a good thing. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else in the administrative report? <coughs> Not in the administrative report. Yeah. So correspondence, I think we have a couple things. One came in today. Do you want to yeah. address anyone we do or whatever? I just wanted to share, yeah, if you wanted to share what came in today or. Yeah, I mean, you, you can. We, we received an anonymous letter that just. Um, from Texas. From Texas that shared uh, several, you know, immediate demands about, you know, ending COVID-19, PCR testing, masking, lockdowns, quarantines, closing uh, states and territorial boundaries, closure of international borders, some things beyond our jurisdiction. A few things. Um, and a few other special notes about, um, you know, about what's happening in the world. So I, I just brought that forward tonight. I thought it might be uh, an opportunity also just to talk a little bit about public comment and correspondence. And, you know, I just want to say personally, I, I, I don't know whether the committee's fully aware of everyone, but we, we have been inundated with, you know, public records requests to the point that um, it's exhaustive. Um, it, it's, it's certainly something that we, we follow with. We comply with the law to its fullest, but um, at a certain point it can become, um, you can get into that intimidating and harassment level. And, and I have some concerns with the amount that we're receiving, the amount of strain and stress that's on our uh, administrators who are just trying to do their jobs and then also try to comp comply with these requests. We've got um, close to 20 requests in the last two weeks, possibly. Yeah. 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 Uh, Michael's our records officer. He needs uh, a tremendous amount of that. And that, that. Those are the official public records requests. There's others that are, are, are coming forward for, and I'm sure we're gonna get uh, more tomorrow uh, following the meeting I had outside around books in the library and we're going to address those as we will but we need to do that in a timely way and I just think it's important for people to understand all that's coming forward um, and I was a bit taken aback tonight with the camera because I don't know whether that that person had asked permission through the chair to record which is required by open meeting law I know I appreciate that we have passed out the Constitution of the United States which determines what people are allowed to say but open meeting law in Massachusetts determines how they're able to say it it's all through the chair. The chair determines what's said, how it's said, and so for somebody to come in and record the session, um, possibly live stream it or whatnot, without permission of the chair, because the chair then needs to let everyone in the room know who's recording and they need to understand those parameters. So yes, it's an open meeting. Yes, you, it can be recorded, but it has to be done in a certain way. So that's why I apologize. I was a little taken aback when, when someone was, was um, recording. Um, and so I think that's important to address. And so yeah. I just wanted to bring that item forward. I don't know if you had any other items. Yeah. Um, I mean, the comment up there, but before that, I'll just say um, on these specific things, I think that, um, I mean, the, what people have to understand is Freedom, Freedom of Information Act requests, yeah, there's a reason for them, they're valid, they, we have to respond to them, but Absolutely. every minute that is spent responding to things takes takes administrators away from their duties. It costs money. We're paying for legal fees. That takes money. We saw the budget tonight. We saw how tight the budget is. And every dollar we're spending on things that are not related to student services are taking away from our students. And so um, I, I have another comment about another correspondence, but I'm going to come up with a question first. I'll come. Um, this is just my second school committee meeting that I'm attending. Um, is it typical that people from other communities come to our, our meetings? So I would say in my 12 years in the district, this is very atypical. So um, I, I have some thoughts on that, and you know, I think we need to discuss it further. Yeah. But I, I feel like we were surprised by a few things tonight, and I think we need to take a step back and, and take a look about how you know, what we are required to allow, what we want to allow within those requirements, sure. and and be better prepared for the next meeting, because there were a number of surprises there, and, and uh, uh, I, I don't, you know, don't want to be surprised a second time. Yeah, if, if I may, Mr. Buckley, too, I, I think another item that folks may not be aware of is that someone uh, came in on the chat and then also jumped in. I mean, all of those things need to go through the chair. That's my understanding, you know, permission to speak. And there's a reason why, you know, yes, it's a public meeting, but that meeting has to function a certain way. And I think, um, especially when our students are here, I, we, we have to follow a procedure and, and really be careful with that. So. Yeah, and, and, and I'll just add, I mean, some of this falls on me as the chair to understand what it is. We've never been, you know, five years of me being on the committee, a couple of years of going to meetings before, never, no one from another committee has come in. And at the same time, 
I would rather, you know, people are allowed to come to public meetings and we have to be careful. We can't, we can't restrict what they say. We can't kick them out for saying something that we might not agree with. And it's just hard. I'd rather err on the side of letting somebody from Arlington speak at the first meeting until we understand whether that's allowed or not allowed. And we figure it out and then we're very clear, you know, up front on who is, who is able to speak and who is not. I'd rather, I don't want to have any, you know, anything that says in any, in any way that we're violating open meeting law. And so if that means a couple of people share their opinions at one meeting, we'll, I'd rather err on that side. And so we'll know beyond that. There's somebody in the chat who is, Mrs. Mrs. Cloney, go ahead, Mrs. Cloney. Mrs. Cloney, did you have something or did you, was it addressed? Sorry, I, sorry, I was on mute talking to myself, sorry. Um, I just wanted to let you know, Dr. Taylor, that it was, um, that the person who was filming did live stream what happened. So if you're making plans for moving forward, um, or for how to prepare for the next meeting, it, that entire interaction before, up and until she got into the room and after she left it was live streamed. Thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Chris, oh, can I talk? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Kristen O'Mara. Um, my, I've been coming to the past three meetings, school committee meetings, and I just want to note that all three had students here from middle school, high school, and elementary schools. Um, and these people, regardless of your content, you know, it's it's not a good look for these kids, and it's it's hard to sit here and listen to all of it happen. Um, I don't think it's a good look for North Reading. I don't think it's a good look for the community. I know everyone here works really hard. Dr. Daly, the whole school committee. Um, countless hours you guys put in for making this town better and you know it's I think going forward I don't know if I know you have to do the public but it's to have schools here and, and people presenting it's it's hard to see and watch and, and I, I will say what one thing that I was gonna bring up when we talk about the upcoming meetings um, <clears throat> there's the balance between if we if we put the public comment at the end and people are here we saw that people were interrupting the, the little school students online that were there, and that is my greatest fear, is that somebody starts heckling students, because some woman tonight, that's literally what she was doing, is heckling students, and perhaps what we should do for the next meeting would, would be just, we start the meeting at 6.30, and we ask the bachelor to present at 7.30, or 7.15 or something, and we just have them show up later on. We have public comment up front. If there is not much but public comment, we move on and then we go to the students at that set time yeah. so that we're done with it before because the, the concern is if, if adults are gonna show up and, and act in that way, they have a right to make a comment, but, but my concern is if they're here heckling students while they're here still because we heard some of the, some of the presentation tonight was about diversity. And so I don't know what, what people would have said. You know, somebody on the Google Meet yeah. obviously objected to it and I think that's, that would be my suggestion for the next meeting is that we just ask the students to show up at a little bit later time rather than the start of the meeting. Yeah, and I think we'll need to set some, <coughs> some guidelines about how we're gonna manage the, yep. uh, the online uh, stream as well. Yep. Uh, thanks to, to Mr. Colleen for handling it at, uh, live as it was happening. So. Janine? Um, obviously we need to reach out to um, the town clerk to find out about you know someone coming in and live streaming like that is wanted allowed do they need to have permission from the school from the chair from you know I they do chair. have to have it from chair officially I so she, not only did this person come in unannounced but refused to pretty much say who they it were was. they could have given some false name and just said they lived in massachusetts well that's yeah. not an address so correct Chris, I think, is, are you, is your hand up? It was. I was just going to tab on to what you were saying about um, the Batchelder presentation next time. And just, uh, I, I agree, there needs to be some sort of <laughs> some sort of way to make sure that things don't get derailed for them. But also just point out that we don't want to put it too late at night because they're yeah. elementary school kids, you know, even 715, 730. I feel bad about kind of pushing them back that far. Yep. 
So the, the other piece of correspondence that I want to just bring up is something where the chair of the select board and I were, were speaking and we had, we had spoken about a lot of what's happening right now, which we're talking about, you know, at this time anyways. And we had a, we had a few suggestions. And so the first one is, while we do not want to respond to specific litigation, I think, you know, Kate Minapelli very clearly expressed to me her appreciation and support for Dr. Daly and the administration here. And I think, and, and the town is also on their side facing some of the same, you know, Freedom of Information Act requests. So what our suggestion was, was first and foremost that we should draft a letter, a joint letter between the select board and the school committee, specifically stating you know, our support and opposition to some of what's happening. And if this committee is okay with this, I would, I would be happy to take the, the pen on this and work with um, whoever, the select board is gonna bring this up tonight as well. And they're gonna have somebody, and we were going to work together on trying to draft a letter. And I think it's important that it's something that all 10 of us on the select board and the school committee can, can agree to because we all put our differences aside and you know, often vote in unison. This isn't about politics. This isn't about positions on, on, on national issues. It's really just about you know, the support of our town administrator and the support of our superintendent. And so we wanted to work on that if people are okay with that. And then the second piece of that was we would probably need to pass that in a joint session between the select board and the school committee. And after that, we think that we should probably go into an executive session to talk about litigation because again some of what's happening is happening on both boards and i think a combined you know collective response and would would be useful and so i guess my question to the other committee members here is do you like the idea of a joint letter of support and meeting with a select board in a joint session if i may so I, McGowan, a couple things yes I, well first of all yep. I think we're talking about just to be just to be clear to the town to re, to residents talking about threatened litigation not actual litigation at Correct. this point in time just to, as a point of clarity um, but i think that this approach makes a lot of sense to me and and i appreciate uh, the, the, the chair of the select board uh, for bringing up the subject and and, and suggesting it so and, and, and on that, I mean, there's also, there's just so much misinformation that's going on right now. There's, there are people that believe that certain members on the, on the school committee, or on the select board are, are part of some of these, these things that are happening when that's not true. And so I think it's really important to Absolutely. get information out there, at least what we can, and to show, like we were talking tonight about the budget. We work very well in this town together and all the elected leaders do. And I just think it would be useful. So you'll, you'll we'll probably see a joint uh, joint meeting on the agenda pretty soon. Um, and I'm planning to reach out to whomever from the select board is, you know, appointed or, or selected to draft something. And we will have to review it in open session and pass it. And I don't know exactly what the form will be, but more to come. Dr. Daly, you look like you had something to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just things going, you know, getting some emails just some concern after the you know after the folks left here the person was continuing to live stream there were things that were said there were things that are on facebook um the building the buildings are secure we, we have um, you know, the police are involved in making sure our buildings are secure there's nothing to worry about um the group was asked to leave they took a few minutes but they politely and, and respectfully left um and any concerns that are addressed i will be addressing we're going to discuss with the police and we will Release any statements in this area. Our buildings are safe and secure. Janine and Chris, are you okay with the approach on the joint joint letter and yes. meeting together? Yes. My, my only problem is the fact that we have to do it. I mean, it's yep. obvious that you know, well, to me, being in this town for as long as <clears> I have, <throat> that you know, the school does an exceptional job. I mean, our students are going to top-notch colleges right out of our little town. So if I think there was a problem with our administration or our teachings or what it is their students are taught, I think it would 
have come to fruition already, so um, I do not have a problem showing or stating support for any of you. You guys do an incredible job. I just dislike the reason that we have to. Yep. Mrs. Cloney? Sorry, I was just gonna say nothing about the letter, but to what Patrick said, there was a comment when the woman live streamed just walking easily into the building. So I just wanted to let you know um, yep. that you can, I won't talk if you already know, I just wanted to make sure you did know. The building's open. We will address any of those concerns. We're not gonna yep. get into it here, but we will address any of those concerns. Yeah. That makes sense to me. I just wanted to make sure you were aware. Yeah, thank you. I'm not quite aware of everything yet, but I will be later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, moving on, future business. Um, we have a meeting on May 2nd, and just to point out the reason none of us are saying nice things about Mrs. Imbriano tonight is that we have one more time to do it. We don't want her head to get too big before the next meeting. <laughs> so hopefully Mrs. Imbriano is there the next meeting and Mr. Papa Vasilio as well, um, so that we can uh, officially honor them and we do thank them for their service. But May 2nd, we have a meeting, their final meeting. Um, the Batch Batchel, Elder School presentation and the fiscal year 23 budget vote. And so, yeah, again, if we if we switch those orders, I think we could do one or the other and we can talk. Take yes. Absolutely. And then May, May 16th will be, and, and are we gonna wait till May 16th, not have a reorganization meeting before that? We usually just wait till May 16th, correct? So May 16th, we will have two new members on the school committee. Um, and we will do the Hood School presentation and CPEC presentation and the school committee reorganization. That'll we are, first. with that? That will yeah, be first. That will be first. Yeah. Yeah. And we will be in here still, right? We're not, we're not going to any schools this year yet? Yeah, we did make the decision earlier in the year. Yeah. Um, and I think, honestly, with all the technology and all that, I mean, yeah. this, um, it, it's, it's cumbersome. We're, we're trying here. We're trying to get yep. this screen, this screen. This, yep. it, this, yep. There's a lot of moving parts here. Yep. Um, and so I think we learn a little, learn here, a little bit every time. So <laughs> yeah, and I think staying here just uh, yep. makes sense. Makes sense. Although it is nice to go to schools, but I think for the rest of this year, I've for the rest of the schools to come. To yep. Me. Okay. With that, if there's nothing further, I will entertain entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh yes, let's adjourn. I move yes, so. Please. A second. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Passes four to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Good everyone. night, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for